Hi, I'm Dave Hatch of TSN's Motorcycle Experience, and this, of course, is Clint McBain, professional road racer. And you know, for the past five years, we've been broadcasting all kinds of tips designed to help you become a better street rider. And now we've put some of those tips into this DVD, and we hope it helps you keep your feet on the pegs and your right hand cranked. Well, you know, Clint, we just picked up these motorcycles from Suzuki for our segments, and uh, we rode up here, and I said, right, first thing we got to do, wash the bikes. And you kind of looked at me like, well, they look pretty clean, but essentially I said, that's the segment we need to do, washing your bike. Now, I have my reasons for washing the bike. I like to get my hands on the machine before I ride it. What about you? It's a little bit of the same. You know, it's, it's nice to get back on the motorcycle, but, uh, you know, I think one step further than that is it's key to inspect the motorcycle. You know, you wash it, get all the dirt and, and debris off it, and hopefully you've done that before you put away, but just in case, yep. even if you have, it's still good to do it. And then when you go through drying the bike, it, it's like an inspection process. You know, maybe start from the front, work your way to the back. Yep. And when I say inspection, I mean, you know, you dry off the wheels and the brake rotors. Maybe grab the brake rotor, you know, give it a, give it a good wiggle, a good pull. Make sure nothing's loose. Check the, check the brake lines, you know, squeeze the lever. Is there any fluid, you know, that's possibly seepage, you know, from being stored all winter? Right. You know, the tires. Yeah. Key, key. That's your contact to the ground. You know, are there any cracks in the tires? If it was stored in a cold environment, they could have cracked over the winter. And then, of course, tire pressure. Right. If it's stored in a cold environment, the pressures are going to go down a little bit, and that's key. Good time to, while you're there anyways, dry in the rims or whatnot, give a quick check and make sure they're, they're all good. And then from there, just continue on back through the bike, looking for any, any flaws. Every time you dry it, is there any cracks, a little bit of oil leaking somewhere? Yeah. Everything, all the way to the back. You know, I'm not talking about taking everything apart and looking at every little piece. It's just a, I don't want to say a quick, it's just a quick, thorough overview of everything. Just like I say, look for oil. Get a clean rag when you dry it. It's already right. clean. If the clean white rag and you dry it off and you look at the rag and all of a sudden there's some oil on it, well, now it's time to maybe a little more thorough. Where's that coming from? Could it harm me in any way? Yeah. You know, things like that, a little tip like that can, can go a long way and make your riding season a lot better. And finally, one other thing, you know, when you go for that first ride of the spring, you're so excited. I think you sort of run out of the house, you haven't even got yourself into riding mode, you just want to start it up and go. I think by saying slow down, wash the bike, it gives you a time to just kind of reacquaint yourself and get your head back into a new season of riding. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay dividends in the end for sure. Great stuff. Wash your bike. Keep it clean. Glad I thought of it. Me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, Clint, we just uh, picked this bike up from Suzuki Canada, and I have to admit that because I've assumed that it's been PDI'd by Suzuki Canada, when we get here to do the shooting, I'm just going to roll this bike off the trailer, and away we go, right? Good plan? Not a real good plan. You know, it's good to get it off the trailer first, yeah. uh, the, but then uh, I'm going to be the one riding that bike, so... <laughs> That's why I thought it'd be a good plan. <laughs> we uh, really should do a pre-flight check, right? We, we do, exactly. When I'm on the racetrack, whenever I go out, you know, I've got mechanics in the pits, and they, I have complete confidence, but they go through the bike from front to end, the whole bike, every time I go out. Right. And, you know, we don't really have that luxury when we're out going for a street ride, so you kind of, the responsibility is up to you as the rider to go through it, and... Uh, there's a little thing that I do every time I go through it just to kind of give it a quick, call it a pre-flight. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this, like you said, this is something we should do every time we come up to our bike and go for a ride. It is, Dave, and it doesn't take long. Right. So, no, this is not a real thorough, thorough inspection. This is just covering some very, very important parts. So, what do you look at? What do I look at? The first thing I look at, I always start, again, kind of front to back, if mm -hmm. you will. I come in, I look at the tires. You know, a quick glance. I don't, I don't see any cord showing. These tires look really good. They're, they look inflated, but... You know, I'm always going to give it, I'm going to grab it and push my thumbs on it. And I know just from an pass when I'm in the garage, I always check my uh, pressures with the gauge. Yeah. So I know roughly what 30 PSI feels like, mm -hmm. right? And that's what, uh, whatever the manufacturer suggests, your tires should be. You got to get a feel for that because you're not always going to have that uh, air pressure gauge. Right. So I know, you know what, I know this is not a flat tire. Yeah. That's going to be okay to ride. Okay. You know, from there, while I'm here, the next thing I do, I go to the brakes because mm -hmm. you're going to need those to stop. Yeah. Right. And again, I'm not going to inspect them that, but I'm going to do a quick check. I'm going to make sure the bolts are not finger loose. Mm -hmm. You know, at least they're, they're somewhat tight. The pinch bolts here holding the axle in, they're tight. You know, the axle nut, the axle, that's tight. It doesn't move. The brakes, grab it. It's, Everything's it's secure. Yeah. And you know, my hand's there. I run it up the line. Just 
I'm not, you know, you can look if you want, but no leaks. I, I got no fluid there. Right. You know, those are pretty good. And yeah. that really took 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, from there, I'm going to go around, go to the back tire, and again, push it, make sure there's air in it. Yeah. On this end. You know, and again, it's, it's good. Back here, the brakes again, all the bolts are tight. Yep. No fluid, looks good. Now while I'm here, I'm going to take a quick peek at the chain mm -hmm. because that's a very important part. You know, from there, I look at it and a lot of times it's greasy. You don't want to get down and touch with your hands. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong just using your foot on it. You know, because of your manual, that, you know, about an inch of slack halfway between the sprockets is good. Yeah. You know, so from there, I get on the bike and the next thing you do is test the levers. Right. Make sure they haven't, no one's knocked your bike over in a parking lot and picked it up and you don't know. Right. Make sure everything moves. Clutch lever, that's good. Brake lever. Yep, she's good. You know, that's good. Pedals, shifter, that's tight. Brake pedal. It's all there. It's, it's all, all there. secure. Okay. Yep. And I guess the last thing is that you said you always sort of do a lock to lock check before you ride away just to make sure nothing's happened there as far as the fork. That's right. Yeah, I just get on, usually start the bike up, back and forth with the bars. It all feels good. Right. Away you go. Look in your mirrors and off I go. Okay, so some great advice there. Never assume that the bike is ready to rock and roll. Give it a pre-flight check every time. All the time. Very, very important. Yeah. Well, some good advice there, Clint. Thanks very much. All right, thanks. Dave. I guess we're ready to get this off the trailer. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. You know, Clint, we finally got this GSXR home and all I want to do is ride it. It's like, let's get it off the trailer, let's go. I'm itching to ride. And you said, nope, one more thing. We've done our pre-flight check. Now you want to adjust it. What do you mean adjust it? Well, Dave, we're going we're gonna to adjust it once here. Mm -hmm. And then that's it. Then we can go ride the thing. But when I say adjust it, I mean to custom fit you. Right. If you will. You're bigger than I am. Mm -hmm. So obviously your reach is probably a little bit more. You know, maybe you want this thing opened up or just a little more comfortable for you. Right. And, and you should. It's, it's your bike, so let's make it fit you. Okay, so when you get a brand new motorcycle home, you don't have to accept it as is as far as the controls are concerned. No, that's right, you don't. And the manufacturers know this. Right. And on most uh, modern bikes nowadays, they all come with uh, adjustable brake levers. Yeah. You know, and they do this because everybody's different. This bike, unfortunately, wasn't made specifically for you. Right, so we've got six adjustment points here for short hands, long hands, I guess also apparel, right? Depending on the thickness of your glove, you may want to adjust the lever. Yep. That's obvious, but you're also talking about where the levers sit, right? Because I can tell just by looking at this, they're too high for me. Yep, you know, Dave, and this is great. We've got it on the trailer here. Right. It's upright. You can get in your normal riding position, mm -hmm. sit on the bike, and uh, yeah, you can see that's your normal riding position. It yeah. looks a little uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, and you can adjust these up and down. Right. Right. No problem. Just loosen it off. Put it where it's comfortable, where it's easily reachable. Because if you need it, you know, for an emergency, you just, you don't need to want to think about it or have to look for it. You just reach out and there it is. Right. Okay. So I'm going to want to bring these down a little bit. Can I open this up too, the clip-ons? Can I swing them around? Yeah. Because it, it feels tight too. The other thing I was going to say is, yeah, you look a little yeah. cramped on there, Dave. Right. Uh, and you can do that. You can open up the bars, if you will. Just slide them out a little bit. Again, they're adjustable. Loosen them off. Move them out, you know, a centimeter here will make a big difference. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it can make a big difference. No, I want that leverage, definitely. Yeah. Um, I, obviously, we can do some adjustments with the mirrors on all of our bikes. Um, what about the throttle? Can I do anything with the, the play in the throttle? You can, Dave, and that's funny that you should mention that, because for me, on the racetrack, that's a big deal. I don't like to have hardly any play at all, so that I know if I need it, it's right there. Right. And again, these are all adjustable. Uh, you don't even need uh, wrenches, usually, on most of them. It's nice to get rid of that play, because for downshifting, and, and if you need to blip the throttle, or in an emergency, when you need to get out of the way right away, yep. with a bit of acceleration, it's nice to know that when you turn that throttle, it's going to go right away. Okay, so once we get this loosened off, we're going to check for the slop in the throttle, make sure there's no slop in there. That's right. Okay, great. And I guess the same applies for the levers, right? The foot levers, we can adjust the brake and the... And the shifter? Yep, and again, that's something you'll have to put your, get your riding gear on, your boots on for that matter. Yep. The brake pedal, it's all adjustable in the back, no problem. Where you want it ideally in your normal riding position is about two or three millimeters below your toe. Right. Right, and that, yep, those threads there will change the height of it. Right, yeah, I, I don't like to have a lot of, I don't want to have to depress the lever too far before I get contact. I like to have it 
pretty close. Oh, well, you have more feel that way, which yeah. is very, very important. And then again, the shift pedal, you want it so it's comfortable. Because again, emergency situation, you need to accelerate out. Sometimes you need to drop a gear immediately without thinking about it or out reaching down to grab the shift lever. You just gotta be able to change the gears and away you go. Okay, well it looks to me like we just need a couple of wrenches from the toolbox. I'll go grab them. We'll get this thing set and then I can go for a ride. All right. But dude. some great advice there. Good stuff. So there's some tips to trailering that I thought we could pass along to the viewers. There's some basics. And I guess the first one, when you look at this trailer setup, the wheel chalk. Excellent advice right there. Get a wheel chalk. It is, Dave. It does a lot of things. Like uh, on this bike, for example, and most bikes, we, uh, we tend to tie the front down via the handlebars. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we have what is called a canyon strap here. So it gives us a good anchoring point. Right. And then from there, we compress the forks and tie it down, but it's hard to get the exact same pressure on either side. And because we're pulling from the handlebar, yeah. you know, as, as you're trailing down the road, if you didn't have a wheel chalk, you hit a bump, the forks could compress a little bit more than they're tightened down and the wheel could turn off slightly. And that, as we know, Tip the counter steer and the bike tips over. So yeah. that's, that's really the big thing with the wheel chalk. Yeah, now if you see this bar here, you can see just how slippery and, uh, and uh, small it is. It'd be very hard to get a good contact patch there, so I really like that. The second thing I notice about the way we've got the bike tied down is that we're using four tie-down points. And more specifically, you took the straps off these passenger pegs and moved them down to the swing arm. So tell us why you did that. <laughs> well, Dave, that's, uh, that's from experience is why I did that. I, you know, I used to tie down up high as well, kind of above the shock, if you will. Mm -hmm. And again, when you're going down the road, you hit a bump, the, the shock, as well as the forks, they compress. That's right. what designed to do. Yep. So if you hit a big bump, that could loosen up. You're, you're tied oh, if down. you're tied down here, it can still bounce around, exactly. right? Exactly. So I had my bike fall over once, and I decided, man, there's got to be a better way. So I started tying it down below the shock, if you will, keeping the wheels on the ground no matter what happened. Right. And still allowing the bike, the suspension, to move just as it would on the street it absorbs the bump right so this way it's a lot more solid it doesn't really matter what you hit it's still solid fastened right to the deck of the trailer perfect now the final thing was you mentioned this canyon strap we're seeing more and more of these they showed up about three four years ago and i think they're the greatest thing since sliced bread but the third thing you did chalk rear then i noticed you took these straps and you turned them around they were originally tied down this way you undid them and turned them around. Now, why did you do that? Well, Dave, usually when I'm loading up my bike, it's by myself, and sometimes it gets difficult. You got a, a few things to do. So the first thing I do when I load it up is, you know, I just get it snugged up, just snugged up enough, and then I climb onto the seat. Right. And from there... Use your weight to compress the yeah, fork. I'm not a real big, strong guy, and for, you know, if it was the other way around, you'd have to pull down on the bike here and pull up this way, and it's pretty tough to get a lot of force going like that. But if you sit on the bike, use your body weight, just lean forward, and at the same time, you could use two hands if you needed to, pull on this strap, pull right. it up. It'll tighten the bike a lot, a lot more. Let your weight do the work. Exactly. I'm a little bit lazy in that regard, so. Oh, I thought it was great. <laughs> it, was, it was wily to see you do it. And finally, of course, we've talked about this before, you tie off this little uh, slip knot. Now, tell us all why you do this. You know, Dave, that's so important. That is the last step for sure. Yeah. But it doesn't matter if you have $2 straps or $30 straps, it doesn't matter what brand, they seem to all slip at some point in time. Right. You know, and this, believe it or not, will save your bike. But tying it off, there's a little bit of a, a knack to it. You have to tie it off so that it, it locks on itself, so get it under the buckle. And then from there, now it can't go anywhere at all. Like it doesn't matter if that buckle were completely let go, it cannot pull on there because as it pulls, it tightens, it tightens the knot even more. So yep. that should be the final thing. You walk around, make sure everything's taut, Make sure they're all tied off, and away you go. Jump in your car and enjoy the track day. Nice job. Thanks, Dave. You know, Clint, the great thing about hosting a motorcycle show is I get a new one of these every year. And it's always like Christmas, but I love getting new helmets. The designs, the lightweight, they just get better every year. But uh, everyone asks me, you know, how important is a helmet? How often should I change my helmet? How do I take care of my helmet? There's still a lot of questions about the old skid lid. Yes, there is, Dave. And you know, I feel, and I'm sure most motorcyclists do, that the helmet is the number one piece of safety equipment that you can have. Right. Uh, we have one head, 
you know, two arms, two legs, you can survive without an arm, but you can't without, without your head. Well, the old adage, remember, $10 head, $10 helmet, right? Invest in a good helmet. That's the first thing I tell people is spend the money, right? Get oh. the protection you need. Yeah, for sure. You know, if you're going to spend the money, though, make sure it fits properly. Right. You know, a helmet, a really expensive helmet that doesn't fit is, it's no better than that $10 helmet. Right. It, it's got to fit. And it's by fit, loose. what I mean is it's got to fit snug. It's got to be comfortable, mm -hmm. but snug. Right. So you should be able to, when you put the helmet on in the store, put it on, don't do up the chin strap, and you should be able to shake your head, shake it side to side, up and down, move it all around. Right. And the helmet should sit firmly on, on your head. You, you don't want it flopping around. When you stop moving your head, is the helmet still doing this? Right. You know, things like that. It needs to fit good. And the, uh, the pressure points. I'm sure we've all put a helmet on. You know, in the store, it feels great. Ah, my forehead. Yeah. Yeah, an hour later, or if you go for a long ride and you do have a pressure point, it can really become annoying. So things, you gotta watch out for that as well. Key, make sure it fits. Um, what about, when is it time to replace it? I hear that a lot. When you drop it? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> unfortunately, it can be. Uh, yeah. Even though they are so expensive, they can be, you need to treat them like an egg, if you will. They're very, very fragile. Mm -hmm. If we were to drop it, say, from here, this is about three feet off the ground, yeah. and let's say it hit a rock or hit something or pick it up, and there's maybe a little mark, nothing, maybe there's no mark at all. Yeah. Really, you don't know what has happened underneath the paint. Yeah. You know, it, it's unlikely, but maybe it did crack underneath there, and you don't want to risk that going out there, and then when you need that helmet the most, it's going to be in an accident, and if it is already cracked, right. you know, it, it could be uh, detrimental to your health. <laughs> So don't leave it teetering on your saddle or hanging off your bar. Like get it down on the ground somewhere. Then it can't drop. That's right. Yeah. I always uh, I always insist on using these too when I get them home. You know, it it gives it a little bit more protection when it's sitting in the closet. You got little ones running around the house. They always want to put daddy's helmet on, right? At least protect it too when you get home. So I've always said too that by cleaning your visor after every ride, it keeps you in contact with your helmet. And then say someone did accidentally bump your helmet or drop it, you will see those little fractures and cracks. So it's important to clean your helmet, keep it clean. That's a very important point, Dave. You know, something that, uh, something that I do all the time but I didn't think to mention it. You'll but include it in your next lecture. Remember that one, please. Well. Some good advice there, Clint. <laughs> you know, Clint, I've been riding for maybe 27 years and I still learn something new every day about our sport. I just got this new helmet, right? Mm -hmm. we, last week we were talking about how to take care of helmets. Yep. Optional cheek pad sizing for custom fit. Optional cheek packs. Well, I started to think about it. You know, it's, this is a medium. I've always been a medium, mm -hmm. but it's a little loose. And you said, Dave, just change the cheek pads. Yeah. What's you know, that all about? <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of people don't know that, but uh, with this helmet, and it's the same with me. A lot of helmets come maybe one or two sizes of shell right probably two sizes. i'm not you know every manufacturer could be different but what it allows you to do i know for for these helmets is to change custom fit like you said change the cheek pads out right they pop out relatively easy you know you can just pop these out for example the sizing should be on there somewhere it happens to be right here easily viewable for us that was the big surprise for me like i popped this one out medium it actually gives you a size yeah see mine is an extra 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 small well they don't make an extra 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 small helmet right so you know i put this helmet on when i got it and it was just a little bit big mm -hmm. so what we did is we did we changed went and got a smaller liner smaller cheek pads yeah and that helped firm it up across my cheeks which eliminated the helmet from moving which is now this helmet now i can truly say this is my helmet this is custom fit to me and it's not going to get any safer than that. Right. So this is a small helmet with triple extra small cheek pads. Mm -hmm. And that's what you need for your head. For my head, I do. So here I've got a medium shell with medium cheek pads. Maybe if I switch down to the small cheek pad, I got a custom fit helmet. Yep. That's, that's right, Dave. Now, w that would really change the way you go shopping for a helmet. Because normally if you put a helmet on and you go, oh, this is just a little on the big size, you're immediately going to reach down to the next size, right? Yeah. Then next size down. Next size could be, like you say, too small. So then you think, well, I need to go to a different brand. And that's not necessarily the case. Right. You just need to custom fit it. You know, get different cheek pads. They even make, 
for these this particular brand they make a different liner like the top part as well for the the crown of your head right you can get i know in here i have an extra small yeah crown on there uh and again it, this helmet is probably the best fitting helmet i've had yet kind of reminds me all of the old days of fitting ski boots yep. very cool well like i said you learn something new every day get a helmet get one that fits right that's right great advice thanks clint you're welcome I'm gonna have to head back to the bike shop You know, Clint, I've always lived by the adage, bet bigger, go home. But you know, when it comes to motorcycling, boating, flying, I don't think it's the greatest approach. No, Dave, I have to agree with you. Uh, At least when you're learning. Yes, oh, for sure when you're learning. Like, when I did get here this morning, I looked at the bikes and I thought, oh, we got a, a couple of 600s here. Or oh, this is a 600 and that's a 650. And I thought, man, it'll be good to ride that. And I looked at the back and it says 1,000. You know, the bikes nowadays are so compact and so small, but they have so much power, mm -hmm. you know, and for someone new to the sport, yep. you know, there's a lot of power. It's a great motorcycle. It handles really well. It does everything you want it to, but it does it quickly. Right. And somebody new to any sport, it's probably a little safer if they started off with something that was a little easier to control. Yeah. You know, so maybe like a, a GS500 or 650 might be a better option when they start out. Right. You know, learn the skills once you have them. Okay, you really enjoy the sport. Now maybe it's time to move up and there's, there's always another bike out there that uh, you can move into. Well, you know, you hit on a very good point. You said learn the skills. And, uh, you know, we've been down to the Freddie Spencer School a few times in Las Vegas. And you know what Freddie says? You have to go slow before you can go fast. And, uh, and I think that's key. When you've gone to get your license and you've taken your training course and it's all been happening in a parking lot, a nice safe environment, and then you've got to get out on the street. I mean, things happen quickly when you get out on the street. Oh, they can happen very quickly. And another thing, you don't have time, a lot of times you don't have time to think about what to do. Like, so your skills, you count on those. Those are what's gonna really help you out. Yeah. And you need to perfect those things and it's gonna be a lot easier to do on a less powerful bike, if you will. Yeah. Something, you know, that you're comfortable with, you can touch the ground on. It's, you know, it's all about learning, getting confidence. Let's face it, those that have confidence seem to enjoy things more. So you've been to the racetrack, you've watched Clint race, and you're thinking, man, the GSXR 1000 is the bike for me, but maybe a GS500 might be the better way to start. I think you're you're absolutely right, Dave. You know, I didn't uh, I didn't start on a 1000. Right. I started neither. on a 600. Yeah. So this week, park the ego, go slow before you go fast. That's right. Good advice. Well, Clint, this week you want to talk about backpack technology, and I was kind of laughing when I saw that on your notes for this week's subject. But, you know, I did think this backpack is about three years old, right? It's not that old. And it's hard to believe backpacks have evolved from this to something like this. But tell me, why are we talking about backpacks? Well, the re for me, I, uh, I get bugged at home all the time. I always want to be prepared. I'm always prepared. When I go out on a ride, if I know I'm going for the day, I want to be prepared and right. I take my backpack. Right. Because in it, I put say, an extra jacket in case it gets cold. Right on. You know, I want to have that. So when I come home at the end, I'll be warm. Right. An extra pair of gloves. As I spoke before, you need a few extra pairs of gloves because the weather's always changing. Right on. You know, I, I like to take a cell phone with me in yep. case, you know, the you unthinkable make, you happens. You run out of gas. Exactly. Okay, you, run exactly. out of gas. you run out of gas. You know, maybe uh, a little bit of food in case you do run out of gas. Yep. You know, you get hungry. A map. Not that I, uh, I usually know where I'm going, but you sure. never know. The map's Real there. Men. Real men never use maps. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Rain gear. You need to take the rain gear, especially uh, I live out west and it can rain just like that. My motto is if you take the rain gear, it won't rain. That's right. Never leave it at home. Yeah. Yeah. And another important thing is uh, a spare visor. I either have a clear or a tinted, opposite what I have on my helmet. In case I am stuck out at night and I have a tinted visor, I can switch. Right. But obviously, as you can see, we have lots of stuff here. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. You forgot this. You're going to put these boots on your feet. I'm going to ride with those boots, yes. Yes. But when I'm out, if we're going antique shopping or whatever, we're going out to a small town to check things out. Yeah. They might not be the most comfortable thing to walk around in. Right. So 
if I've got room in the end, which I usually do, I put a pair of spare pair of shoes in there just to uh, to switch up when I'm out uh, sightseeing and stuff. You really like to be comfortable, don't you? I like to be prepared. Now tell me, what do you look for when you go shopping for a backpack? Well, there's several things. As you can see, this one here is, is quite heavy duty. Yeah. You know, it, it could be the possibility you might go down mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's probably going to protect you a fair bit as well. Um, the straps, there's not a lot of straps on this one. Yeah. So it's not going to be flapping too much, but there's some key straps. For example, here on your shoulder straps, it's got a, a strap that goes, a, clips on across your chest. Yeah. Which what that's going to do is hold some of the weight, hold the straps evenly on you. Mm -hmm. So the weight's not going to be digging into your arms up here and it's going to allow you to move freely on the bike, which is very, very important. Probably one of the most important things with the backpack. Right. And one other thing too, if you do, like we have a lot of stuff here, but it's pretty light. If you find that it is pretty heavy, yeah. I recommend not wearing it like a backpack, maybe yeah. just strapping it onto the bike and as a piece of luggage instead. If That's where the cargo net comes in handy. Exactly, yeah. if it's pretty heavy. Yeah, or distracting in any way, just, just strap it onto the bike. You can clearly see that this is designed for motorcycling. It's got a flap that actually comes over the top, gives it a bit of rain protection, and then, as you said, um, buttons up so tightly that really, in the end, there's nothing to flap around and distract you while you're riding. That's right. You so know, it sounds to me like it's important to get a purpose-built backpack. For sure. Right? For motorcycles, it is. Yeah. Some great advice on backpack technology. Yeah. Don't leave home without it. Be prepared. Good advice. Thanks, Clint. You're welcome. So, Clint, we've got a beautiful fall day here. We're about to head out for a bit of riding. And uh, I was thinking earlier this week, even though it's the fall, we hit 29 degrees Celsius down here in Prince Edward County. And I thought, We've got to do something about gloves because I was still seeing people out this weekend, no gloves, fingerless gloves. And as you've said all along, gloves are one of the most important pieces of gear you can own. Yep, Dave, it's, it's amazing that people still ride without gloves. With the selections today, you've got, you've got everything. We've got summer weight gloves, we've got call mid-season glove, we'll call it. Yeah. And then we've got uh, fall riding or, or uh, colder weather gloves. Right. And to see people without them, they, you know, when you fall over, and unfortunately sometimes motorcycles do, yeah. it's a natural instinct for anything. The first thing you do is stick your hands out. Right. right. At any speed. Exactly. If you're walking down here and we trip, you stick your hands out. Right. Imagine what that'll do at 100 kilometers an hour, 50 kilometers an hour. Maybe a little bit of gravel. Yeah. Oh, don't want to think about it. Right. So it's really important to get on a pair of gloves. Now, you mentioned there's, there's a glove for every season. You've got these new lightweight gloves. These are great for the summertime. They are. They're, uh, like you say, lightweight. The materials they're made out of, uh, it allows air to flow through the exterior of the glove, but it still has some, some hard armor there. So if you do tip over and your hands hits the ground, you're going to be protected there. Right. Keep your hands cool on those hot, hot days. Right. And then you have uh, like a glove like this, which can be kind of a mid-season or, or an all-season glove. It, it, it flows through, some air flows through a little bit through some areas, but it's got leather on the, on the top, so it gives you a little bit more warmth, if you will. The palm's still nice and protected with leather. The cuff comes up a little bit higher, so it's going to keep a little bit more of the wind out. And that one's Gore-Tex, so that'll also give you a little bit of protection in a, in a light rain as well. You bet you will, yeah. yeah. And then you get into a cold weather glove. And this you're going to need when you're riding, uh, again, out here I think some of you guys ride year round, is it not? And I've actually used those gloves and uh, you know, like zero, two degrees Celsius, they're perfect. Hands stay warm. Toasty warm. So you're in control of the bike. And then one other thing is that you have these gloves here, which are great, all purpose gloves. Right. They're insulated, they're warmth, and they also, if you get stuck in the rain, they have a little rain sock in here. You just pull it out. And there Voila. it is, it slides right over top of the glove, so you're protected uh, from the elements. Excellent idea. Well, you bring a good point up, and that is, perhaps you start out on a ride, this morning you go out, it's sunny, you're wearing your lightweight glove, the afternoon it rains, now what do you do? I guess something like that is perfect, but the other option is take more than one pair of gloves. Oh, for sure, Dave. You know, with the selection, there's so many, and uh, if you're a true motorcycle enthusiast, you're probably going to have a couple pairs of gloves, and it, it can't hurt to throw another pair in your backpack or maybe under your seat. Because if you know you're going for a long ride, start out in the morning, and it's a beautiful morning like today, yep. you're going to start with a cooler weather glove. 
and then uh, you know maybe throw a glove like this in there for the evening if you're coming back at night or if it starts to rain. Right. We've all been stuck in the rain and it's no fun uh, trying to ride a motorcycle with cold wet hands. It makes it tough. Bottom line, get a pair of gloves on those hands, in some cases maybe more than one pair of gloves and take them with you at all times. That's right Dave. Be prepared. You know, Clint, I've been motorcycling for 25 years now, and my uh, motorcycling apparel has evolved a lot, especially in the last 10 years. As, as the Gore-Tex has come on stream, as the carbon fiber has come along, uh, all my gear has changed. And, and what I've noticed is a lot of it's black. You know, I've, I'm sitting here with these new black boots. I've got the Icon jeans. If I'm not wearing these, I'm wearing, you know, some kind of Gore-Tex pant. And then I've got, you know, the lightweight summer, but I've also got the heavier leather and even heavier beyond that. And of course the helmet and gloves. Everything I have is black. Well, Dave, I don't want to say it's not all right, but uh, black is great during the day. Well, it's slimming <laughs> and I need all the help I can get. <laughs> That's right. But it, uh, you know, during the day it's fine because it's usually bright out, right? And it's easily to, to see. But at night, and a lot of us do ride at night, mm -hmm. you know, I... Personally, I enjoy going for a nighttime ride. It's just it's nice and peaceful. And, and yep. for myself, as you can see, I'm trying to be flashy here with the colors. Yeah, well, you're doing a good job I, there. It's my style. Yeah. No, but the reason I'm doing this is so that I can be seen a lot easier right. at night. You know, motorcycles nowadays, uh, they're smaller and everything is more compact. And, and we know car drivers aren't aware of that. And yeah. they, half the time, they don't see us anyways. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything we can do to make ourselves seen, and the easiest thing is, is dress flashy. Right. Well, the, you know, I do have a few tricks up my sleeve. For instance, the boots I'm wearing have that reflective tape on them, so when I'm sort of moving my foot around on the pegs, this catches the eye of the drivers and the headlights of the drivers around me. I also carry along with me one of those reflective vests. Well, so at nighttime, I can throw that sucker on and that just puts me right out there as far as nighttime driving. But you said, uh, you notice there's a difference between our helmets. There's even more you can do. Well, yeah, Dave, you know, we, these are the same helmets. Right. You know, they're, they're identical, really, other than the fact that mine's a little more flashy. Yeah, I and notice you've got a few extra stickers on there. I do, and, and the reason for it is to dress it up a little bit, you know, to go for that. But the other thing is, if you notice on the back here, this silver is all uh, reflective. Right. So at nighttime, as soon as some headlights hit this, it's just going to, it's like, being an actual light, it's just going to light up like like crazy, and that's what you want. Right. You want to make sure you're you're not shocking those other drivers, but you're letting them know, hey, wow, there's something there. What was that? Right. You're making them aware that you're out there, and it's just it's a safety thing, right? You're going to need. You never know when you need it. So with my booties kind of rolling around, catching the light, my reflective vest, and then if I was to throw a few bits of reflective tape that you can buy at. Uh, Canadian tire, throw some of that on the back of the helmet, I'm covered for nighttime riding. Yes, you're getting there again. You just but I need some flashy clothes yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's the new thing. You got to get flashy, man. Yeah. Okay, well, some great advice there for daytime and nighttime riding. Good stuff. Thanks, Dave. Nice, nice gloves. Yeah, pretty flash, eh? Michael Jackson's got nothing. You know, Clint, obviously you earn your living out on the racetrack and uh, you said to me earlier that a lot of fans of yours come up to you at the racetrack on a superbike weekend and they'll say, how do you know how fast to go through a corner? And I mean, it's obvious when you're at the track, you have practice sessions, you can get up to speed. But when we apply that to the street, it's pretty, it's actually a really good question. How do you know how fast to go through a corner? I'm glad, you know, I'm glad you asked that question, Dave, <laughs> because you're right. It, uh, you know, a lot of time, the obvious is the street sign, right? It'll, it'll say the posted marking might be 50 kilometers an hour and it'll have a, an arrow to the left or the right. And that's the obvious, you know, right. it, an indication that you need to slow down for that corner. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, what if that's not there? Yeah, what if you're on a back road? Like down here, we have a lot of back roads with no signs. Mm -hmm. And that's the same as the racetrack. There are no speed limit signs for us there either. You know, if, the thing for me, one of the, the main things, is I have to, my goal is to maintain traction all the way through that corner. Right. Right, to get out safely on the other side, wherever it may be. You know, a couple of key things is always keep your eyes up. Look as far as you can through the corner, mm -hmm. right, to, to, so it gives you an idea of how fast you got to go. And as now, I'm slowing but, down. But what if it's a blind corner? Well, that's, you know, that's a good indication. If you can't see very far through it, yeah. it's probably pretty sharp. Right. Right. So get that slow down, get that slowing down, get your, 
your downshifts, you get all those done before. Right. You know, continue slowing down through it. But a couple of key things to watch for uh, can be, you know, power poles, for example, on the side of the road. If you see the power lines running there with you and all of a sudden they take a, a quick bend, they're all of a sudden, they look like they're perpendicular right in front of you. Yeah. You know, that's a good indication that that road is making a sudden turn. It's gonna tighten up. It's gonna tighten up, exactly. Yeah. You know, if that, and if they're not there, another good one that I really, I look for is, uh, skid marks on the road believe it or not mm -hmm. it uh, you know try to learn from other people's mistakes instead of your own so basically when it comes to cornering on the street and there are no signs up ahead scan the horizon keep your eyes moving and do a little detective work yep yeah it's gonna pay off for you in the end great advice thanks Clint right. you know Clint last week we were talking about cornering and how to judge your cornering speed and we wrapped that one up and I was thinking to myself, what about the novice riders, the ones that are just getting into the sport and they're trying to keep up with their friends, right? The inevitable is going to happen. You're trying to ride with some people that are faster than you. You get into a corner and suddenly, whoa, you panic. You're going too fast for your skills through that corner. What do you do now? <laughs> you know, Dave, that happens, like you said, mostly, not all the time, but a lot when you start out being new to the sport, but it also happens, you know, when I'm sure you've been there. I've been there not so long ago. Right. I went in a little bit too fast. But fortunate for me, myself, and the people that have been doing it for a while, the key is not to panic. I heard you mention the word panic, and that's, the majority of the time, that's what people do. Right. They panic, and when you panic, you usually tighten up. Your first reaction is to grab the brakes and sit up, and right away, you've now got the bike sitting up straight and you're kind of locked into a position where the bike really doesn't want to turn. It doesn't really want to do anything. You know, you're right. It, it, you've panicked, you've squeezed, you tensed up on the bike and those are all things that you do not want to do. Right. You know, the first thing you want to do is look for safety. Always. And safety is not, oh my gosh, I'm going too fast, I'm going to run off the, the road. Right. Is look through the corner. You will go where your eyes go. You know, from there, if you can stay relaxed on the motorcycle, you know, if you have to slow down with more than just roll, rolling off the throttle, gently, mm -hmm. not too quickly, that will help. It'll help tighten up the line as you're in a little bit more lean angle. It'll tighten up your line as you slow down a little bit. Or if you do have to go to the brakes, you have to be very gentle with it. Right. Which it's very hard to do when you're tight on the, on the controls. Right. You need to, I want to say relax. It's hard in a situation like that, but let's just say let's not panic. Look where you want to go. If you have to lean the bike over a little bit more and slow down with the throttle, nice and gently, everything is smooth and controlled and you know, eight times out of 10, nine times out of 10, you'll make it through there all right. You might surprise yourself. That's right, you know, at this point, you just wanna get through the corner safely. Right, so turn your eyes, turn your head, look for the exit, maybe slow down a little bit with that throttle if you can, but really lean the bike and ride it out. Yep, it'll, it'll surprise you. Good advice. You know, the fun thing about motorcycling is that uh, when you start talking about sport bikes and even bikes like this Bandit, more and more people are getting involved in track days. And a lot of the stuff we discuss here in this segment can be applied to your track day. Um, one thing I'd like to explore is, because uh, I just witnessed you do it last weekend, is what happens when you get into that corner, it's too hot, too fast, you've misjudged the speed, and oh my goodness, there's no saving it. You're leaving the pavement. What do you do then? What do you do then? Well, the biggest thing, again, Dave, is, is try not to panic. And ultimately, you want to stay on the track as long as possible. Right. Right? Uh, <laughs> the incident we're referring to me, myself, is, you know, I got in a little bit hot and, and I tried to slow down for the corner. And, and well, the one thing I didn't do, I realized you know, pretty quick that, you know what, I'm not going to make that corner how I want to make that corner. I'm not going to be able to make the apex or stay in my lane if we were on the street. Uh, but I continued, I didn't abort the plan. Mm -hmm. My plan was still to slow down and that should be your plan as well. You still have to get your motorcycle slowed down. Continue slowing down, you know, use all that pavement there. Try not to panic. Just because you don't make the corner at the apex, there still could be 30 feet of pavement over there. Right. You know, and the first thing you want to do, especially if you're on the street, is look up 
and again, always keep looking up. Make sure there's nothing coming. If there's nothing coming, no cars coming, nothing there, don't be afraid to use that pavement to get your bike slowed down to a reasonable amount of speed. Mm -hmm. And then if the inevitable happens and you have to go off, if you choose to go off the pavement, which should be the last option, but if you do choose to go off it, yeah. we're gonna have to get off that rear, that, sorry, that front brake and get onto that rear brake. Right, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pavement grass scenario. Pavement, you're braking as much as you can, upright as much as you can, front brake. As soon as you get off the, the, the uh, concrete or the cement, right away that's when you stop using that front brake because this grass may look like it's solid and predictable but really it might as well be ice right on this motorcycle yeah there's no these are pretty slick tires mm -hmm. they're dot tires they're made for pavement right not grass so yeah there it can be very difficult to get the motorcycle slowed down with the front brake on the grass and like we mentioned earlier the rear brake is also for stability right it will help you keep that motorcycle upright a little bit well, some great advice on how to survive eh, a little hot action in the corner. Yeah, a little misjudging. Good stuff. Well, Clint, I can honestly say that in the 16, 17 year history of this program, we've only had to discuss this subject once before, and I try to avoid it like the plague because it's kind of a black art to try to describe it counter steering right but you said let's do it man I'm, I'm ready counter steering let's talk about it well Dave the reason I say that because I think it's so important to riding you know you've got your counter steering which allows you to avoid accidents mm -hmm. or, or objects or anything like that and braking those two things as you know I'm very adamant about right uh, the counter steering the whole process of that is actually just as it says counter steering you, you steer the bike in the opposite direction of a turn just to initiate that turn right now, the first key here is, this is when you're going fast, right? Faster than, say, 30K? That's right, Dave. Uh, anything below 25, 30K is, is normal, kind of like a car, if you will. You turn the direction you want to go. Right. Right? But as you get up faster, over 30 kilometers an hour, you have these wheels, mm -hmm. which start, are these gyroscopes when they're spinning, these big heavy wheels that are turning. Yeah. And it's hard. They want to stay upright. Yeah. They do. Like if you could lock the throttle on and let go, the bike would stay upright if it never hit anything and it yeah. would go forever. Yeah. So, but we have to turn sometimes. So we got to get those wheels, these gyroscopes, off their center axis. Right. So what we do then, we're coming up, let's just use a left-hand turn, for example. You know, we want to go left. So we need to actually push. We need to steer the bars yeah. to the right just, and that makes the wheels come off their center and it helps initiate the turn for the bike to go left. Right. Now I'm going to break that down a little simpler because I know it gets a little complicated. For a left hand turn, we're going to push on the left hand handlebar or clip on. Mm -hmm. For a right hand turn, we're going to push the bar in the direction we want to go right. is what it is. And that is enough to initiate the turn, to start the turn. It gets the bike off its center. Again, I know you've heard me mention it lots of times, smooth. Right. The key is to be smooth, always smooth. You're controlling the bike, so you need to control it smoothly. Mm -hmm. And something else that I want to get into is that as we go faster, you know, we're above 30 kilometers now, let's say we go to 60 kilometers or 100 kilometers an hour. The faster you go, right. the more effort is required to sure. get that bike off its center axis, to get those gyroscopes to actually turn. Right. So if you want to be smooth with this and you want to get a real feel for it, Practice. Practice. So important, so important. Again, with speed, the faster you go, the more effort required. Okay, so this is all about counter steering. Over 30 clicks, you push right to turn right, the way I remember it. Push left to turn left. Practice it, and uh, it's very important, especially the faster you're going to know this for obstacle avoidance. So make sure you practice your counter steering. Correct, Dave. I yeah. think we got through that. I can't <laughs> wait to see all the emails. Thanks, man. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, Clint, you know, one of the reasons why we're tucked in here behind the house is that it's a very, as you can see, very windy day. And you said, hey, perfect opportunity to talk about gusty winds or crosswinds. And I thought, you know what? 15 seasons, we've never talked about crosswinds. Excellent idea. Yeah, no, I think it's definitely time. The, mm -hmm. the crosswinds are always there. You know, sometimes more this time of year in the fall yep. than in the summer. And uh, it's, 
it can be quite alarming if you've ever been caught in a sudden crosswind, that's for sure. I'd have to say the most difficult crosswind was the, the bridge from New Brunswick to PEI. We had an, a really scary crossing one day. The wind was tremendous. Right, yeah. and uh, there are a few things that you can do to kind of ease the, ease the tension, if you will, mm -hmm. in the crosswind. Probably one of the most important things to do is uh, it's kind of against human nature. Normally you want to hang on a little bit tighter because it's blowing you around a bit. Sure. But what you need to do is relax. Maybe loosen that grip on the handlebars. Get those elbows down. Get them bent. Get them drooped so that you're comfortable. Right. And what that does is if your bike does get blown off course or gets a little bit unstable, mm -hmm. at least it'll just keep that in the front end. It won't transfer it all the way through your bike. Right. Right. And it'll, it'll straighten itself out right away. Right. So stay loose, relax. Because your first response is, oh, I'm getting blown around and you sort of tighten up. You don't want to do that. No, you don't. Uh, because what's going to happen is, is the wind, it is going to blow you off course mm -hmm. if it's strong enough. And it will blow you off course. Uh, you don't want to try to anticipate it because A, you can't see the wind. Yes. You don't know for sure how hard that gust is going to be. So if you can't see it, it's pretty hard to anticipate what it's going to do. Right. But what so what should you do? You need to react to it. So okay. if it does, it's going to blow you off course. You know, and you'll move over, and then as long as you're not tight gripped on the bars and, and nervous, just, you know, counter steer, put the bike back. Yeah, but should you change your position as far as where you are in the lane, for instance? Yes, Dave, that's a very good point. You want to, that anticipation, you want to make sure you put it, the bike in maybe the center of the lane. Okay. Just because it gives you a little bit more room on either way. Mm -hmm. You know, if the wind's coming from, say, left to right, yeah. you know, and then you have a semi coming down against you, even though the wind's blowing you to the right, when that semi goes by, it's going to stop the right. wind suddenly and you could veer back towards the left. So you don't want to be on the yellow line because you're going to get kind of sucked into the, the semi. So just give yourself a little bit of room on either side right. just for the, the wind. So when maybe normally you'd be riding in tire tracks, you know, inside tire track or outside tire track, in this case, just cheat yourself to the center and give yourself some room to, to move, move around a little bit. Yep, that's, that's very good advice. Uh, someone asked me uh, through an email question, what about traction? Do you lose traction in any way, shape or form? You don't lose traction. No. What, you know, the wind, it's not blowing you hard enough to blow the wheels right out from underneath you. Okay. You know, and if that case may be, or if you felt that that was going to be the case, you'd best to pull over anyways. But right. back to the traction issue, it doesn't affect traction. It's, it's the same either way. So you can just eliminate that from the thought, pro thought process, if you will, and just Stay relaxed on the bike. You slowly veer off course. Just counter steer and get it, you know, nice and gently. Yep. Counter steer, put it back on course. Leave yourself some room on either side, and uh, just enjoy the ride. Okay. Well, I can certainly. The wind is still gusting. I think we're going to hit some crosswinds today. Some great advice. I'll remember to stay loose and adjust my lane position. Thanks, Clint. Well, last season we talked a lot about cornering and cornering technique and setting up for the corners and then we got some emails. What about obstacle avoidance when you're in a corner? So let's add a little spice. Let's talk about how to get around something when you're committed to a corner. Yeah, Dave, that uh, on the street that can happen quite a bit. You know, maybe I forget, tend to forget about that a little bit being on the racetrack so much. But, uh, you know, if you're coming into, let's say, a blind corner, mm -hmm. meaning one you can't see all the way around, you know, on the racetrack, we use, try to use the whole track. We'll come in, let's use a left corner for example. We'll enter the corner from the right hand side of the track. One of the reasons we do that, we make the corner visually seem bigger. Open it up. Open it up. And again, same thing on the street. It's a blind corner, so you can't see all the way around it, but if you could make it so you could see more, three, of, it. more of it, that would be better. Right. So, you know, a corner, blind corners like that, come in, enter it as wide as you can and look far ahead. Right. So let's say now we're in the corner. It's a big corner. We've committed. We've steered the bike into it. And all of a sudden, let's, there's water there. Someone was having a water fight and they dropped a bunch of water there. So now we're committed. We're leaned over. And if you are doing it correctly, using your whole lane, because that's your lane, you enter the corner. You're on your line on the inside of the lane. You come there, you think you've got too much speed. I have to avoid this. Well, you can't avoid it. You're going to have to go through it. It's water. Right. The best thing to do would be to try to slow down if you can. Roll the throttle off a little bit. Yes, but smoothly. Yes. Right? It's got to be smooth because you're leaned over. Mm -hmm. Right? So do that smoothly if you can. But if you can't, for some reason, whatever it is, you've got your whole lane. It could be 20, 30 feet wide, whatever it is. When you come up to the obstacle, 
stand the bike up a little bit. Right. Right. And what that's going to do to your bike is it's going to make it one run run wide mm -hmm. but that's okay because you've still got that 20 or 30 feet there you gave yourself that right? that's right that's your cushion a safety cushion we'll call it okay you know go through that we've cleared the water now you know but now we're on the outside of the lane we still got more corner don't forget we got to continue cornering right so just it should be no problem because we haven't panicked we're looking far ahead right mm -hmm. we're seeing it. it's a big corner we just put the bike back down lean it back down and away we go right. finish off the corner and it's just perfectly fine no alarm bells went off or anything okay so a couple of things in this one is leave yourself enough room open up the corner as it is when you're taking the corner Two, make sure you exercise smooth throttle control three stand the bike up as you go through the wet the, the slick water if you will and then get yourself back on and by leaning yourself back into the corner all of these things are things we can practice right we can do this up in a parking lot on a weekend exactly Dave and, and as you know I'm very adamant about the practice right you know being a racer I practice all the time practice my skills and being yourself a motorcycle rider enthusiast we need to practice those these skills all the time because you never know when you need it and when you need it on the street is uh, you want to make sure it's there in your back pocket great some great advice I think we're ready to hit the road thanks Clint all right thanks Dave Well, Clint, this week you want to talk about braking, and we've covered braking several times over the last three years, but this time specifically, not really how to brake in terms of technique, but you want to talk about practicing your braking. That's correct, Dave. Braking is one of those skills, it's, uh, I feel it's one of the most important skills on a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. If done properly, it can save your bacon. Right. You know, it can, you know, someone comes out in front of you and you need to stop suddenly, you need to know how to do it. Right. Which brings us to the point. How can you just call upon it instantly? You need to get out and practice it. Right. Yeah, so, that's so you really want to practice enough that braking becomes second nature and you're not even thinking about it anymore, right? That's right, Dave. You know, and uh, you should really practice almost every day. Every time you get on your bike to go for a ride, mm -hmm. you should. You know, let's say today it's raining. Well, obviously it's not, but today it's sunny. Right. The braking distance is going to be a lot different today than say on a rainy day right. or a cold day as opposed to a hot day right it's going to be different you know braking in the morning to the afternoon it's always different and you need to learn the limits of your motorcycle right well a lot of people uh, just entering into the sport they'll have got their license braking on a bike that didn't even belong to them now they've gone out and purchased a new bike or a used bike and again the braking will be different from what they learned on so just quickly tell us, what should we do if we set out on a Sunday morning, we head over to the local university or shopping plaza, there's no cars, we're going to practice our braking, what should we do? Well, the first thing you want to do is, is find an area where you can practice it. You know, like, like you said, an empty university parking lot, uh, just the back road, that's, that's, Sunday morning is a great time, usually not a lot of traffic. You know, check your mirrors, start out gradually, you know, maybe go first, second gear, practice, rolling off the throttle gently, applying the brakes, and one thing I do want to mention is squeezing the brake lever. Right. Never grabbing the brake lever. Right. Nothing jerky. It's a gentle squeeze, build the pressure, slow the bike down. But again, start off first, second gear, you know, from there do that a few times, get the feel of it, increase the speed. Right. You know, and, and then what you want to do is practice at the speed that you normally ride. Okay. If you're all, we're out here kind of rule, if we ride at 80 kilometers an hour, well let's practice stopping from 80 kilometers an hour. Okay. That's when you're going to need it, right? Right, so practice with the front brake alone, see what that does, then try incorporating the rear brake. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe throw in a rear brake only, see what that does. And I'm sure you're going to be quite surprised, it doesn't do a lot. Right. You know, together, they'll, they'll work well. Well, the main thing too is everyone's bike is different, so practicing on a GSX-R600 and practicing on a big Volusia, it's going to be a very different experience and you want to know the difference. Yep, that's correct, Dave. You know, I brought this motorcycle out here the other day. And this, even though it's a, the same type of bike that I race with, the first thing I did when I left Suzuki was I practiced a few stops slowing down to see what these brakes feel like. Right. You know, that was, that was the first thing I did. Okay. And it, uh, I was fortunate I didn't have to call upon it, but if I do, I'm now prepared. I know what it's going to slow down like. Okay, some great advice there. So don't leave your braking to the last minute. Get out there and practice. Good stuff. Well, Clint, this week you want to talk about using the rear brake, and it's funny, you know, like once once front brakes started getting really good and really strong, 
a lot of people used to joke, especially at the racetrack, they used to joke about take the rear brake and throw it away, I'll never use it. But you know, the rear brake is suddenly coming around again and it's not just for braking. You're right, Dave. It, uh, it is a big thing at the racetrack. A lot of guys don't use it at all. But one thing over the last few years that I've really learned about it is I use it to control the motorcycle in other ways. Uh, to add stability, things like that. Not necessarily to get the stopping power from it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for example, in a corner, let's say a long left-hand corner, if I come in a little bit too quick, you know, and I'm right at, on the racetrack, I know I'm right on the edge of, of traction and everything, and I don't want to roll off the throttle because I could overweight the front tire and, and lose traction and, and slide out. But a good idea is to apply a little bit of rear brake while I have the throttle on, just over top of it, mm -hmm. and that will slow me down enough, you know, maybe to tighten up my radius of the corner, things like that. So, you know, it's funny, you talked about using the rear brake over the throttle, and I think that's key. You know, what you're saying is your throttle and your brakes, rear or front, they're not on-off switches, right? I, I, I try to refer to them more as dimmer switches, so really you're kind of rolling off the throttle a little bit at the same time you're applying the rear brake. They're not switches anymore, they're dimmers. That's correct, Dave. You know, everything, all the controls on the motorcycle, it would be great if people operated them like that all the time. If you have to get on the front brakes, brakes really hard to stop, if you do it suddenly, like just like an on-off switch, just slam them on, mm -hmm. it's going to lock up the front end of the motorcycle before it even compresses the force compressor or anything. Right. You know, a good idea, a little bit of rear brake before, just as you're rolling off the throttle, Yeah. will control that weight transfer. It'll be nice and smooth to the front. Now we're on the front brakes. Now, as the weight comes down, then you build up the pressure. Right. Again, controlled. Sometimes it has to be quickly, but it is still controlled. Geez, the rear brake, it's just not for braking anymore. Yeah, it would be nice if they almost uh, call it the rear control pedal. Hey, not bad. Oh, there you go. Well, I think we're going to do it right here on Motorcycle Experience. You've heard it here first. The rear brake has now been renamed. No longer the rear brake, it's it, the rear control. The rear control pedal. Yeah, that's, that's what we're great. going to call it. Good stuff, Clint. That's some really good advice there. You know, Clint, uh, I know you want to continue on this theme of know your motorcycle and, and more specifically we're talking about brakes and I get worried because we spend so much time with sport bikes, you being a road racer and riding bikes like this GSXR, um, we talk a lot about front brake technique but there's a lot of cruiser riders out there, custom bike riders, who may, this may not necessarily apply to them. I mean they've got a front brake but they've got a rear brake as well and in some cases that may be more effective for them. You're absolutely right there, Dave. You know, when we say know your motorcycle, uh, by that I mean, you know, the sport bike here, it's designed, it's very short, you know, it's got a very steep geometry on the bike, the forks underneath there, and it's got big brakes on the front in comparison to the rear. Right. So this just tells me before I get on it, it's probably more stopping power up front. Right. But on a cruiser, you know, the bike is stretched out a little further, mm -hmm. it's a little bit heavier, mm -hmm. you know, the rear brake tends to be a little bit bigger as well. Yep. And just by looking at it, knowing it, I am going to think that that's got a little bit more stopping power right. on the rear. Not more than the front, but it's going to be more effective right. with the rear than say a sport bike. Well certainly looking at a cruiser you know that you're not going to get quite the same amount of weight transfer as you do on a bike like this. So let's talk specifically about that rear brake. Let's not ignore it. Let's talk about how to use it. W what are you suggesting we do there? Well it's going to be very effective for one, especially on the big bike because as you mentioned that weight transfer, mm -hmm. we're not going to get as much of that weight transfer on the big bigger bike because it's stretched out a little further. Right. Right. So it's going to keep some of that weight at the back end and those bikes nowadays have these huge rear tires on. Right. Right. So that rear brake is going to be more effective. Mm -hmm. But we still have to know how to operate it. Right. And that goes the same for all of our controls. As I always mention, being smooth on them. Right. You, know, you get on the rear brake, build the pressure up until you feel it, and then slowly keep building the pressure just to that point just before lockup, mm -hmm. a threshold braking type of thing. And it should almost sound like a howl from the rear tire. And that's kind of the limit there. Any, any more and you're going to lock up the rear end. Right. So this is where we get into the know your bike. So I keep saying get out to the college parking lot on a weekend or in our case we have an old deserted airstrip that we can practice but get out there and practice the braking technique. 
Yep, that's right, Dave. And, and that technique, let's elaborate on that a bit, is just, again, you want to practice that emergency braking, threshold braking, if you will. Just accelerate up at different speeds so you can understand the feel of it and practice applying the brakes. Right. First getting on smoothly, building the pressure up just before lockup. And, and try doing it quicker, you know, getting on it quicker, still smoothly, but just the whole process a little quicker. Right. And also, one more thing, I want you to lock it up. Oh, you do? A couple times, for practice, yes, because it could happen in the real world. Okay. Right, and then yeah. from there, if it does happen, you know, there's two things you can do. You can, A, just release it, right, and the wheel's gonna start to go again, and your bike's gonna come back in line. Mm -hmm. Or, if, you know, a lot of things happen sometimes and you forget to release it and it does happen, it's just like in a car, just steer into the direction that the rear wheel is skidding and it will keep the bike upright. Right. You know, and from there, you can just release it, but you make sure you get back on it if you're not stopped in time. Okay, some great advice and uh, we'll be sure to get out there and start practicing our rear braking technique. Thanks, Clint. No problem. You know, Clint, last week we were talking about the rear brake, more specifically how to use the rear brake on a cruiser, and uh, there was some great advice there, but when we turned off the camera, you leaned to me and you said, you know what, Dave, you can do a lot more with the rear brake than just stop. And I said, right, that's our next subject. So let's talk about the rear brake beyond just stopping. What can we do with it beyond that? Well, there's a few things we can do with it, Dave, and you know, the, one of the first things is controlling the weight transfer mm -hmm. on the motorcycle. And I say this because it's so important when you're in an emergency braking situation where you need to stop your motorcycle as quickly as possible. Right. Right. And, and with most motorcycles, actually I'm going to say all motorcycles, the majority of the braking power is in the front end. Right. Right. But it's only there if we get the weight on top of it. Right. Right. And the rear brake can control how quickly that weight gets to the front of the motorcycle. I think what I'm hearing here is that it can be used as a, a bit of a stabilizer, right? You don't want to just go straight for the front brake and get all the weight forward. You want to slow the transfer. You want to, and I always mention controlled, right? right? You want to be in control of this motorcycle at all times. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're doing. You're controlling that weight transfer. Instead of just grabbing at the front brake, all of a sudden all this weight is thrown forward immediately. And without that weight there, putting it there controlled, you can lock up the front Right. Before you get the weight there, believe it or not. Okay, so a little bit of rear brake just before you go to the full front brake. And it'll stop you that much quicker. Okay, we're talking about some serious advanced stuff here now. The other thing is, you can actually steer the bike in a corner using the rear brake. You better explain this one. Alright Dave, I'm going to use a left hand corner. For example, being that the rear brake is on the right hand side of the motorcycle. Okay. Let's say we're going into a corner, a blind corner, one we don't know very well. We're looking ahead mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we notice that corner is starting to get a little tighter. It's a decreasing radius. That's right. Dave. Right. Okay. So we're in there, but we're already committed to the corner. We've already turned, we're leaned over, we're looking ahead, and now the corner is getting tighter. Mm -hmm. So we've got to either A, follow the radius, tighten up the corner, or we're going to go into opposing traffic or the right. other lane. So in order to do that, the first instinct is to roll off the throttle or apply front brake. Right. Or both. But we know that if we do that, it's going to put, it could put too much weight onto the front end too quickly. Right. So something to do in that case is just keep the throttle constant, look ahead where we want to go, yeah. and apply the rear brake right over top of the throttle. Mm -hmm. Meaning don't back off the throttle, just push on the rear brake pedal. And right. what it's going to do is it's going to slow the bike and therefore it's going to tighten up your line right. and you're going to go through the corner. Perfect. Now, as I said, this is pretty advanced stuff, so you really do need to get out there and practice it, right? Because it's all about being smooth with these controls. That's right, and I always, I'm a big advocate of practice, practice, practice. Yeah, I don't mean to harp on this every week, but this is all really good stuff. You just have to get used to doing it. Yep, yeah, and a great place is an empty parking lot. Mm -hmm. Usually Sunday afternoons or something, the school parking lot, nice and empty. Right. Just go practice. You can go in a big circle if you want, for that matter. Practice keeping a constant throttle and just applying the rear brake. Okay. A little bit, see what it does. Apply it a little bit more, see what it does. Excellent. Some great tips on using the rear brake for more than just braking. Well, Clint, there's a lot of people taking high performance riding schools. There's a lot of people taking riding courses for a second time, third time, just to refresh themselves. And I guess when they're going back and they're, they're taking these courses, they're learning a little bit more about something called trail braking because the whole evolution of braking is improving. As the brakes improve, our braking techniques are improving. So maybe we should just talk a little bit about trail braking. 
You know, Dave, it's a great topic. Uh, a lot, I get asked that question a lot. What, what is trail breaking? A lot of people hear it more and more. Trail breaking is basically just trailing your brakes into the corner. Mm -hmm. So it's trailing the brakes after the point of initiating your turn. Right. So that would mean to turn the bike, we got to lean the bike. So we are going to be braking as we're leaning the bike into a corner. Okay. So again, we're not approaching the brake as if it's an on-off switch. Here comes a corner. Let's stop. We'll slow down for the corner. Let's let go of the brakes and let's turn. It's not like an on-off switch. We're now gently applying and gently releasing, right? We're trailing it out. That's correct, Dave. You know, again, the first thing we're doing is we're looking up to see that corner. Mm -hmm. You know, we've entered a corner. We're coming in. And because we're looking ahead, we realize, you know what, maybe I didn't quite break enough. I'm going to have to trail break in here, into this corner a little bit. So what you do, you come in, you have to steer for the corner. Yeah. Instead of opting to run straight, you need to steer for it. But instead of just releasing the brakes, just trail them on. Just hold them on. But one key thing to keep in mind, is as your bike is tipped over, your contact patch, the tires that are the part that's touching the pavement is going to get smaller as the bike tips over. Right. So you're probably going to have to release the brake slowly and smoothly, as you say. Right. It's, it takes a bit lot of practice to get it right, mm -hmm. and it's a feeling thing. And but with that practice, you can get it right, and it's really it's not that complicated. Right. Now you want to get when you're on the racetrack, you want to get through that corner as quickly as possible. Are you trail braking? Dave, I trail brake almost. Well, at all the corners, every corner. Right. You know, what it does is it puts your bike in the best position for it to steer as well because it compresses the forks and keeps them compressed. And the bike, the way they're designed, they turn the best when the forks are compressed. Right. That's the engineers. They know what they're doing when they design these things. I guess the other thing, too, is by keeping a little bit of constant pressure on the brakes, you're not unsettling the bike. You're not upsetting it. You're kind of loading it, braking and then you're keeping it sort of loaded all the way through the corner, right? That's right, and then by doing that, one of the key things then is the point when you do actually have to release the brake, mm -hmm. because as you, as you had mentioned, when we do have that load on the front, because of the brakes, when we release it, that some of that energy is gonna go to the rear, so it takes, again, lots of practice and a smooth hand, that point when the brake is released to getting on the throttle a little bit, because eventually you need to get that weight off the front tire and onto the rear tire to start your drive out. Right. So that point in the corner is very key, and that's where, like I say, just keep practicing and practicing and practicing. And it doesn't mean come in the corner at 50 mile an hour and all of a sudden the first time I'm going to trail brake. We come in at, you know, whatever, 10 kilometers an hour or something, nice and slow. We trail brake in a little bit. Next time maybe do a little, little more, just at your comfort zone. Everyone's different, so just keep within your comfort zone and improve your skills. Okay, so remember, your brakes are not an on-off switch, and get out there and practice on the weekend and practice trailing, slowly releasing those brakes. That's right, Dave. Great advice. Thank you. You know, Clint, I'm just looking over this new uh, GSX-R1000 and I notice three adjustable pieces on the rear shock, three ways to adjust the front fork. And I'm wondering how many people even start to play with that stuff? Yeah, you know, the suspension thing can be uh, it's kind of a mystery, it, right? It, it the can black be. art. Yeah, exactly. There's lots of ways, lots of ways to skin a cat, as they say, and it can be the same with the suspension. But uh, you know, the key to it, uh, it's there. They put it on the motorcycle, and like you say, there's adjustments in three different ways on, on that particular motorcycle. People seldom touch it. Right. Uh, it brings kind of a little story I'll share with you. This this past summer, we were riding down in uh, Halifax, and I had uh, a Bandit. It was a 1250, and I was out with a friend, and he was on a different bike, and we were riding. And man, it wasn't the greatest ride for me. Mm -hmm. it, I was really getting bounced around and the wheels didn't feel like they were on the pavement all the time. It was really a harsh feeling and I wasn't enjoying the ride as much as I should be. So, you know, from there I took out the manual, read the manual and, and, and I saw about the suspension and, and I wanted to soften it up a little bit. Right. So it would be nice and soft. So More I, compliant. Exactly, exactly what I wanted to do. Read the manual and said maybe take some preload out. So I looked at it and said, preloads on the top. It has the adjustability. So I did. I took a little bit out of there. I took some out of the rear shock just with the tools on the bike. It was really simple and easy to do. Followed in the manual and man, it just changed the whole characteristic of the motorcycle and we had a great time. A key thing that we do on the racetrack um, is before we start adjusting it, write down. You know, if this is backed out, the preload's out all the way or 
You notice it has little lines on here for adjustment. Say it's at the fourth line in. Just write it all down on a piece of paper first right. so you don't get lost when you start adjusting it. Right. Because that can happen. Okay. You know, so you know where to go back to if you kind of get lost. At least you know that's what it was. You're familiar with that. And from there, just adjust one thing at a time. Yeah. Go out, test drive it. Is it better? Is it worse? You know, it's better. Great. If it's worse, go the other way. Pretty much what you do at the racetrack, right? You create a baseline, you mark it with a marker, or you write it down on a pad of paper, make one adjustment at a time, test it out. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, like I say, don't be scared to try it out a little bit. If you're not familiar, not mechanical, you can always take it to your dealer too. Uh, it's a really quite a simple process and they can, I'm sure they'd love to help you out with it because it's your motorcycle. Make it work for you. Some great advice, Clint. So Clint, last week we were talking about your suspension and the adjustability of your suspension and, and even how your body weight, you can adjust the suspension to work better for the body weight uh, on the motorcycle. And I started thinking, you know, body weight. We haven't even talked about what your body weight does to a motorcycle, right? You, you, you shift your body weight all the time during a race. Yeah, you're right, Dave. It's something that maybe we should have talked about a long time ago. Maybe it's uh, something I overlooked, but it, it is so important. You know, nowadays, a motorcycle, the average motorcycle's 400 to 600 pounds. You know, the average rider's 160, 170 pounds. It's like a fourth of the weight. Right. And it's propped up high, right? So it has a huge effect on the bike. Right. You know, so let's, I think we should talk about how we can use that to our advantage on the bike. Well, I know we, we sort of talk more towards sport bike riders and uh, standard motorcycle riders uh, in this segment. And I can tell you, we've been to a lot of racing schools, the, the Spencer School down in Vegas. They, do a, they devote a whole lesson to just shifting your weight onto the pegs and how to steer the motorcycle with your feet. And you just see a lot of people going, what? Steering with my feet? I thought I was supposed to use my hands. Yeah, no, it... Uh I'm sure you experienced it. It's quite amazing, isn't it? Yeah. How it really works well. You know, a, a little drill to try at home, you know, just to get that feeling is if you're going down a, a, a road in a straight line, no one around, you know, just loosen up your grip on the handlebars and really concentrate on putting a lot of weight onto that right, right peg, for example, mm -hmm. and, and just let the bars kind of do what they want to do. And, and you'll notice the bike will veer to the right. Right. You know, make sure you stop it before you hit oncoming traffic or something. But then, you know, do the same back the other way. Just a controlled grip. And once you experience that, you know, if you think about that combined with that input, you know, from, from the handlebars, man, it's going to be effortless yeah. to steer that motorcycle. Okay, so we're moving our cheeks, we're moving our feet, we're weighting the pegs, we're lowering the center of gravity. Uh, you also mentioned to me there's a lot of upper body movement as well, right? Just getting your upper body sort of moved off that center line of the motorcycle, that will also help you turn? Yes, it will, Dave. You know, I think it's, it's just important, if not more important, than, than your, the bottom half. I think 40% of your body weight is from about your, your mid-torso and up. Right. right, that's a lot of weight, and just by getting it over a little bit, a few inches from one side to the other, it doesn't mean we have to hang way off right or left. Just, just a little bit, as you know, it's a timing thing. If you can do that timed with weighting that peg, because as you move over, there's going to be more weight automatically that goes on that peg. Right, and if you do it at the right time with a lot of practice, it'll just the bike will just, I want to say, fall, and it will just lean in gently into the corner. And it'll be, like I say, effortless, and it, and it can really make, uh, make your riding more enjoyable. It gives you more confidence. Okay, so for all you novice riders, you first-time riders out there, this is not an easy chair. It's not a comfy chair. You don't just plant your butt and stay right in the center. Practice moving around a little bit on the motorcycle and shifting your weight. That's right, and be smooth, always. Be smooth. He's smooth. Yeah. Very smooth. Good tip. Okay, riding in traffic. One of the most difficult things to do on a motorcycle, especially if you're not prone to being a proactive individual. But really, we have to talk about being proactive here, right? Not being passive when you're in traffic. That's right, Dave. You know, uh, as we know, on the street, there can be so many hazards everywhere, and, and motorcycles are smaller than vehicles. They, just, they are. Sometimes they're hard to see. You need to uh, make yourself seen. Right. You need to. That's going to help save you. You know, and that's one of the beauties of a motorcycle. We can choose which side of the lane we want to drive in, unlike a car or a truck. Mm -hmm. So one thing to do is, is 
protect your lane or ride in a position in your lane where you can be seen. Right. You know, if you're in a two-lane road, both, both lanes go in the same direction, make sure you let people know by positioning yourself correctly that that is your piece of property, if you will. Right. You know, and then on the left-hand side, you've got enough room an escape route in case there's a hazard that comes up or you do need to move quickly. Well, I'm sure all of us, you know, I'm sure you've experienced a situation where you're in that two-lane road heading in one direction, you're in the curb lane, you maybe have drifted just a little too close to the curb and somebody behind you is in a big hurry and they think they can pass you in your own lane as if you're a bicycle. And yeah. that's extremely dangerous. Oh, it is. It is, Dave. And that's, uh, that's part of protecting your lane, being right. proactive, letting them, making a statement, if you will. Let them know, this is, this is my little piece of the road. You know, get in the left portion of that lane. Right. Protect it. Let okay. them know you're there. And another good thing, cars in front of you, make sure you can see them in their mirrors. Because if you can't see them, they can't see you. They can't see you. It's not just the car beside you, it's the cars in front, the cars behind, it's everywhere. Right. Blind spots. That's, that's what we were just talking about, the blind spots. Being able to see in the mirrors of the car in front of you, their, their head. Because if you can't see them, they can't see you, and wherever you are, which is usually back around the rear bumper of the car, that is a blind spot. Right. And that is a no-no. You want to eliminate those as much as possible. Again, being proactive, move around that car, drop back, just get out of the blind spot. Yeah, if, if you have to go a little bit quicker, it's safer to do that than stay in that blind spot. You know, that person, a lot of times, they don't even shoulder check. They're in a car, they have nothing to worry about, right? The worst they're going to do is hit a motorcyclist. Right. Lastly, riding in traffic, billboards, big trucks, big vans, following those vehicles, what should you do there? You don't. You don't want to try to eliminate that again. And that's just being aware of your surroundings. If up ahead you see you're in close, or coming up to some trucks or whatnot, make sure you're not going to get stuck right behind them. If you are behind them and there's traffic all around you, you're stuck there. You've got the buffeting of the wind to deal with. Uh, you've got you know, cars on either side, you can't get out of there if something does come up. And if something does come up, like, I don't know, a two by four on the road, you don't have much time to react to it because right. that, you can't see it ahead of time. Right. So just the best thing to do is eliminate those situations. Get around the truck when it's safe to do so or just don't, don't let yourself get behind it. Okay, so be proactive, not aggressive, not proactive. Aggressive. Lane position, protect your lane, watch the blind spots, stay away from the billboards. That's right. Good traffic advice. You know, Clint, the last time we got together, you said, next time we got to talk about the death spot. And I said, okay, I've heard of the blind spot, but I've never heard of the death spot. What is it? Well, Dave, you're sitting in it right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it can be a pretty harsh term, but uh, it, it, I think it's appropriate. The death spot is what we call it, would be right where you are in relation to this automobile here, this truck. And that spot is the, from the rear bumper up to a direct line of sight straight across from the driver. From now, from here, you can't see the driver in any of his mirrors, therefore he can't see you. Mm -hmm. And even if you were to shoulder check to look out the side, you're, he can't see you because the headrest of the other, the passenger seat there and, and the cross arm coming down. Right. And the other thing, if he decides he's going to change lanes, you're, it's not going to be right in front of you, so you're not going to see it as soon. Peripherally you will, but it's going to take a couple seconds to pick up on that, and then we could have an ugly situation. Okay, so when we're talking about riding in traffic, this is the absolute worst place to be. It is. You Never can, be here. Not You can pass through quickly, yep. but do not stay here. Okay, so back to being aggressive, or sorry, proactive. Move ahead, drop back. Okay, Correct. so I'm going to drop back, right? Okay. I've decided I want to get out of the death spot and I'm going to go right here. Now this is pretty safe because I've cleared the vehicle, right? That's correct. Yeah, you're cleared. If this guy wants to change lanes, he can do so without you doing anything and he's not going to hit you. Right. But now we've moved from the death spot to the blind spot. Right. Can you see the driver's head in his mirrors? Uh, if there was a driver sitting in that truck, no. no I would can't. not be able to see that driver's face. And therefore that guy can't see you, so hence the name blind, blind spot. Right. And then here, second most dangerous spot on the exactly, road. Exactly, second most dangerous spot. Yeah. See, Dave, the the blind spot. I'm in. I'm okay. I can see the driver. I'm not in the blind spot. But you, on the other hand, can you see the driver in his mirror? No, not at all. And I'm sure he can't see you either. 
you are in the blind spot. So you need to either move yourself over here so that you can be seen, so mm -hmm. you're not blind anymore, and he, or just pull up ahead and then you've eliminated all that potential hazard. Right. So from here, because you're on a motorcycle and you can choose which part of the lane you want to be in, right. you need to get yourself in a, a proactive position so that you can see that driver and that vehicle so that they can see you. Right. So you're out of the blind spot, you're not in the death spot, or better yet, just go on, be proactive, just get ahead of them and then you're safe. Okay, so either pass this vehicle or drop back sort of behind this vehicle or get right back out of the blind spot. That's correct, Dave. Okay, well you learn something new every day. I'll certainly avoid the death spot. Absolutely, don't do that. And the blind spot. The blind spot too. Good stuff. Well, Clint, we get a lot of email at the show, and somebody sent me an email and said, if you had to give someone one piece of advice at the beginning of a season, spring riding time, what would that one piece of advice be? And I said, well, the eyes have it. Dave, that's great advice, the eyes. Meaning, look up, look ahead, look where you're going, look for hazards. Keep your eyes moving, just look, 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 look ahead, look. Eyes, eyes are so important to our sport. They are. You know that. Uh, I know I mentioned that braking is so important, but even one step before that would be your eyes. You know, if you can spot the hazard before it comes, then you're not going to need to do any emergency braking or any emergency avoidance. Okay. Use the eyes. Let's go down the checklist. At speed, when you're moving down the highway, how far ahead are we looking? As far as possible. Okay. You know, the further you look ahead. It's going to give you more time to react and I want as much time as I can to react. I want to react nice and slow because I've seen whatever's happening way ahead. Right. Corners? Again, it's the same thing. Look where you want to go, where you want to be. You want to be at the end of that corner. You want to make it through that corner. So look there. You will go. It's, it's quite amazing, but you will go where you're looking. Right. It's been proven, you know, and if you're going through a corner and you keep looking at the outside, the curb over there, nine times out of ten, where are you going to be? At that curb, and that's not where you want to be. Look to where you want to be. Look through the corner. Look at the exit. When I'm riding with my daughters in the dirt, I'm always saying, turn your head, turn your head, right? Look where you want to go. Mirrors. Mirrors. Again, it's not where you want to go, it's where you've been, but when we're on motorcycles, we don't have a lot of protection from behind. So you want to be aware of everything around you, meaning behind you as well. So you're constantly looking in your mirrors. You should be looking in your mirrors, say, every five seconds. Just getting, you know, just a quick glance, take a quick peek what's there. Keep that as a little mental picture, you know, five seconds later, another quick glance, see if things have changed. You never know what you have to do. There could be someone, a car speeding up on you that you want to maybe just get out of the way. Keep your eyes moving, looking farther ahead looking around the bend, look where you want to go, turn your head, obstacle avoidance. Yes, that's a very important one. We've all heard or seen, maybe we've all seen a ball or a, or a child or something run out in front Big of you. Big chunk of tire. Anything. What do you do? Well, you see that and your first thing is, oh, look at that. Oh, I got to avoid that. And you keep staring at the object that's gotten in your way. And if you do that, chances are you're going to hit it or come very close to it. What you want to do, we all have peripheral vision. Use it. Let's use it. Okay, we've seen the obstacle come out in front of us. Now what we need to do to be safe is look for a safe way around the object. Right. Look for the safety zone. That's where you want to be. And keep looking there because you're going to go where your eyes go and you want to go the safe way around. Keep your eyes moving. Look away. That's right. Perfect. So, one tip for the spring, the eyes have it. That's right. Keep them up. Keep them open. Keep them moving. Keep looking. You know, Clint, in these segments, uh, we've been focusing more and more on sport bike riding and novice riders this season. And I, I bet, you know, if you were to ask me, what do I think novice riders are most fearful of? I would have to say it's taking a passenger. Yeah, Dave, it can be, uh, they shouldn't be fearful of it, but it can be bit of a different experience, a little challenging. Right. There's lots of things that you have to think about that happen actually before you even get on the motorcycle. And one of the key points is having a discussion like we're doing now. Right. There is certain rules for the passenger when they are on the motorcycle. So before you even start out, 
you have to have a little bit of a pre-flight discussion. And, uh, and I guess the first thing you discuss is how to get on the motorcycle. That's right. The first thing that I want you to do, I'm going to take you for a ride. The first thing I want you to do, I'm going to get on this motorcycle. I'm going to get it upright with my feet, feet firmly planted on the ground. I'll probably uh, pull in the front brake lever so it doesn't roll forward or back. And then I'm going to ask you, once I give you the nod, yes, I'm ready, you know, to, to get on the motorcycle. And, and to do that, I don't want you just to pull out the rear peg and, and Put your foot on the stirrup there and jump over like it's a horse. <laughs> <laughs> or just dive on like it's a pommel horse. Yeah, yeah like you're, you're a fairly big big fella and that's going to be a lot of weight for me. You know, get on as smoothly as you can. Hopefully you can just swing a leg over. Right. Get on comfortably. And then, you know, from there, let me know. Yeah, okay, give me a tap or just say, yeah, I'm ready to go. Right. Now we are ready to start riding. Right. And at that point, I can either hang on to your waist or I can hang on, if the bike has grips, hand grips, I can hold on to the handrail. Um, but I guess the next thing is what to do while we're moving, and I guess most importantly, nothing. <laughs> Stay put, right? That, that is correct. I do want you to, to move as little as possible. You know, we spoke earlier in the year about uh, body weight. Well, now I have double the body weight on my motorcycle. So now it's almost half the weight of the motorcycle sitting up here on top of it. So it's going to have a huge effect on how this thing handles. Right. There's that aspect, and then there's the getting off again, right? This is when bikes fall over, when they're parked and people just jump off. Oh, it's, you know, it's kind of it's kind of humorous when you see it happen because it's, and all because there's no communication. Right. It's the same as getting in. All you have to do, you know, I'll just tell you, okay, my feet will be firmly planted, finger on the brake, say, now it's time. I'm you ready. Know? Yep, go ahead, get off. There you go, you're off. Now it's time for me to get off. It's simple, but that's when the majority of the incidents happen is in the parking lot. Okay, well... Not to be feared, something to be embraced. It's always fun to take somebody else along on the sport. Try it out, but make sure you have that pre-flight discussion. That's right. Great advice. Okay, I'll share with you some of my signals. I've got fuel, fuel. need gas, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, uh, slow down, slow down, we use that one a lot, and Sometimes we'll use this along with the turn signal. Okay. That's about the limit of my hand signals. Right. With the left hand, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. Just, make, just, just checking, making yeah. sure. Yeah. But um, you want to talk about group riding as we sit here waiting to go on a group ride this afternoon. Communication, you said. Make sure you get those signals out in the open before you start your ride, right? That's right, Dave. Communication is the key to having a good, safe group ride. Right. You know, as we're doing here, we're talking about things. You know, you're letting me know some of the signals that you used in the past. Right. You know, we're uh, when the, the rest of the guys are going to get here, we're going to ask or find out where we're going to go. Mm -hmm. You know, who's going to start off leading? Who knows this uh, area the best? You right. Know, they're probably the best person to have in the lead for now. Yeah. You know, uh, what, what type of ride are we going on? That's right. Is it going to be, are we going to look at antiques in the next town? Are we going on a good sport ride? Mm -hmm. You know, we need to keep the verbal communication going and get everybody involved once they all get here. Yeah, I think in order for everyone to be happy, you've got to find out what everyone's objectives are. You know, are we sightseeing? Okay. Are we, as you said, spirited sport riding? What are we out to do? Um, one of the things that's become difficult for us here is a lot, it's been great. A lot of our neighbors and friends have all got their licenses lately, and it's right. been fabulous. But as a result, we have a whole group of people that come on a group ride, and they're all riding at different levels. And that sometimes can be stressful as a group ride. It, it can be, I guess, if, if maybe you're, well, one of the faster guys or maybe one of the, the newcomers coming up. But the idea of the group is. A group ride. Everybody rides together. Right. You know, you can learn off of each other, but you know, when it is time for one of the slower riders to lead, for example, you know what? Just if you just stay back in your position, and then maybe that's time for you to enjoy some of the sights a little bit more. You know, maybe work on practice some of your other skills. Right. You know, it's not a time to show those guys that you're faster and go blazing past them. Yeah, I think it's really important when you're riding with a group where there's a various, when there's a variety of levels of experience, I think it's important to try to ride at the level of the least experienced rider, right? Yeah, that's correct. You know, another good good thing to do is uh, the straightaways, we can all go fast in the straightaways. We know that. It's easy to, to twist the throttle on, but the straightaways are the time for a group to, to regroup. Right. You know, so when you come to a straightaway, maybe you, you set that as a rule in our communication before. You know, when we come to straightaways, the leader is going to, you know, gather up the group again. Maybe just go to the posted speed limit or maybe just a little bit under or whatever is safe to do so. Right. And allow, make sure all the riders get back together and then 
if that's the time to switch leaders, you do so and then you're ready for your next uh, set of corners coming up. Right, so generally what happens is that it's in the corners that you start to lose or people start to drop back um, depending on their experience. So it makes perfect sense that once you exit those last set of corners, then slow up and gather everyone up again, right? So then everyone can ride at their own level. Yeah, you can ride at your own level and you can still ride as a group. That's why we started the ride, right? Well, some good communication. I guess that's the key to group riding, communication, right? That's correct, Dave. You know, one more thing that I want to throw in there is, is the group. Yeah. You know, if you know that that group, that group of riders maybe rides a little bit too fast for you, mm -hmm. it's probably better off to make that decision right at the beginning. Maybe just, it's not a good idea to join them. Right. You know, that's, that's key. That's also very, very important. Know your limit. Yes. Ride within it. That's right. New slogan for this season. Good advice there, Clint. All right, thanks, Dave. Thank you. You know, Clint, earlier this season we talked about what to pack in your backpack for a day trip. And you know what you forgot? <laughs> I do. <laughs> the parking puck. The yes. parking puck. And, uh, I was sort of ribbing you about that, and um, you mentioned, well, we should talk about parking, right? Yeah, no, parking is, uh, it seems like a pretty simple self-explanatory thing to do but there's a, a few things that you need to keep in mind when mm -hmm. parking a motorcycle one of them is the parking pot or the foot and since we forgot i forgot to put mine in my backpack yeah other things to use is i happen to have this empty coke can that was just sitting there yeah. this this can be used and what we do with this we'll just uh squish it down very technical yes make a nice flat object if we didn't have this maybe we could have a flat rock or something hey you know, a parking puck there we are Perfect. Yeah. And what we use that for is just to place down and put our kickstand, put it underneath our kickstand. Now why, why do we do this? This is going to disperse some of the weight mm -hmm. so that that kickstand does not sink into the ground. Right. You know, it can, believe it or not, it can even happen on asphalt like this, especially new asphalt that's really black and in a hot summer day, it's a little bit soft still. Yeah. You know, it'll, it'll just sink slowly. You'll go in for lunch, come back out, and there's your motorcycle laying on its side. More inclined to happen on gravel and for sure on a grass, a wet damp grassy day, you park in a field somewhere, walk away, come yeah. back, your bike's lying over yeah. on its side. Sure. Okay, so parking puck's important. What else about parking? Another thing you want to do is when you park your motorcycle, you want it to be seen, right? It's no good if you see a spot, maybe like parallel parking on the street, mm -hmm. you'd like to back into that spot because of the camber in the road, they're usually sloped to the outside. Yeah. So it makes it, uh, if you were to pull in forward, it makes it a little difficult when it's time to leave. You gotta back out into traffic and then pull ahead. So this way, if you back in, maybe leave it on about a 45 degree angle with the flow of traffic. Yeah. It makes it that much easier when you go to start off. Yeah. And once, it, if it is at that 45 degree angle, it can be seen by other motorists. Mm -hmm. So hopefully what they see, they won't hit. Right. Which is a, is a good thing. Anything about putting the rear tire against the curb or staying away from the curb, where should the bike be once you roll it into its spot? Yeah, you want to back it up so that the rear wheel just touches the curb because that's going to act like a parking brake, if okay. you will. It's going to eliminate it from rolling back and, and that's going to help when it's time to start out too because of the camber on the road which is sloped towards the gutter or the curb. Mm -hmm. So the bike's going to stay back there, but when it's time to leave, Instead of having the bike worry about it rolling backwards, when you put it in gear, you can just curb a hold it there and away you go. One thing to keep in mind though is uh, if there is a spot, let's say it's behind a, a big SUV, it might not be a great idea to park there. Yeah. Because that person could enter their vehicle, come in it from the front and not even see your bike behind them because their vehicle is so big and back up into it and knock it over and we've all seen that before. Right. I guess you don't want a squeezing between parked cars where there really isn't a space. I mean, that's nice that you can do that, but you're really, I don't even think that's legal. No, I'm not too sure. And you're just, you're limiting yourself. You know, you're setting your bike up for accident. Right. You know, these people, they left that space there so that they could get out. Right. You know, and then you come in and put your bike there. Well, it's probably going to get hit. A recipe for disaster. Yeah. And the other thing is when you come out, when it is time to leave, yeah, now you're 90 degrees perpendicular to the traffic and if it is a single lane yeah sometimes it's it's hard you got to pull right out before you can turn and you could just... be riding right into oncoming traffic yeah. okay so be visible park on a 45 and bump up against the uh, the curb yeah and don't forget the puck don't forget the puck all right some excellent advice on parking your motorcycle I thought it was just simple yeah 
You know, Clint, usually when we're talking about traffic situations with the viewers at home, we talk about being on the offense. But uh, now we're going to talk about something a little different here. We're talking about traffic, but uh, when we were talking about off camera, it sounded to me like you were being a little on the defense, especially with the school zones. Well, Dave, on the defense, I wouldn't say so. I'm, I'm in my my mind, it's the off in the offense. Yeah. I'm looking in my mind with with my eyes. They're mm -hmm. they're working. They're going forward. I'm planning ahead. Right. To come up to the school zone. As soon as I see that sign, school zone, you know, I think kids. It's gonna be kids. It's gonna be the the stereotypical ball that rolls out between the cars, and here comes a child running at it. Right. You know. So I'm gonna start already. I'm gonna have a plan. Yeah. Slow you know? down. Slow down for one, yeah. you know, that's the plan there. I might move over a little bit, give myself a little more room mm -hmm. in that lane. That's my lane, the whole thing. Right. Right. I can move over. No one says I have to ride in this part of the lane. Right. right? Cover the brake. Cover the brake. Yeah. Definitely cover the brake. Be ready. Be ready. Yeah. You know, so that's that's one thing in the school zone. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm leading you through this because I do the same thing. As soon as I get into a residential neighborhood with a lot of parked cars, I have that same imagery. Kid running out, going for the ball. So I do all those things. Slow down, cover the brake, get, you know, get ready. Yeah, that's, that's great. You know, you said parked cars. Well, how about this? About cars. Do you ever uh, make yourself aware of the type of car that's around you? Hmm, I know where you're going with this. So yeah. you come up on a car and it's kind of run down. What are you thinking when you do that? Well, the first thing that I think is, man, that car, the person driving the car, you know, what type of person are they? They obviously don't let, care about their car. Right. You know, for one, they've let it get to that state. Do they care about their driving? So sketchy car, sketchy driver. That's the first thing that I think of, mm -hmm. right? We've got that, we've got the big truck. A truck with the big wheels and the stereo going and the, and the noisy muffler. Young kid, not too much in the driving department as far, as far as experience is concerned. Probably young and aggressive. Right. Yeah, she's so doing that. You've got the minivan uh -huh. or the grocery getter, whatever you want to call it. But immediately when I hear that, I think of a family. Mm -hmm. Lots right. of kids maybe making a bit of noise inside the van, distracting the driver. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, those things, being aware being on the offense, looking around you, being aware of everything that's there, these possible hazards. Right. That's what I'm talking about. Now that's a good defense. Okay. <laughs> I'm not getting back into the <laughs> offense defense thing. I'm going to add one more thing to the list. The guy with the cell phone. Uh, as I, soon as I see that, I want to get around that driver. Yeah. That driver is probably the most common one out there these days. Mm -hmm. uh, he's usually the one, he or she, is usually the one that you know waits till the last minute to do anything because right. they're so busy talking on the phone. Mm -hmm. You know they could oh I got to turn here and the way they go they could slam on the brakes last minute because they're just not paying attention to their driving. Right. Okay, so we're we're talking about keeping our eyes moving, still being offensive, and looking out for things like sketchy cars, big trucks with big wheels, minivans, and the guy with the cell phone. Just be aware of what's around you. Hopefully we won't get too many emails about this one. <laughs> Thanks. Good stuff. You know, Clint, over the years we've been a lot of discussion about intersections and how dangerous intersections can be for a motorcyclist, one of the most dangerous places on the road. But we're always talking about going through the intersection and how to prepare for that. What about coming up to an intersection and stopping? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Dave, because a lot of people think once their motorcycles stop, they're safe. Right. Right, which is not necessarily the case, especially at an intersection. Well, that's the time you flip up the visor, you sit back, give the wrists a bit of a break, and, you know, chill. That's right, and then when you hear squealing tires behind you... <laughs> panic. <laughs> yes, exactly, and that's what we try to eliminate all the time, is those panic situations. Right. Okay, so what do you suggest we do when we get to an intersection? Well, if you're the first person there, let's say, for mm -hmm. example, you get up there, you, you, as you're braking up to it, you downshift say, in first gear, right. second gear. I would, what I always do, I'm constantly scanning my mirrors, even when I'm stopped, Yeah. right? Make sure that the person behind me is paying attention. So you're staying in first gear with the clutch in? Correct. I'm ready to go. Okay. You know, immediately when I stop there, by me leaving it in gear with the clutch in, I have a plan. Okay. In case I hear that's really the tires. <laughs> Somebody has got off the phone and suddenly realized you're there. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm ready to move out of harm's way. Okay, now that's, that's one thing that worries me a little bit. I can see people saying, yeah, but Clint, if I release the clutch and pull ahead, should somebody be coming up fast behind me, I'm going to pull into oncoming traffic, right? Because I'm at a red light. So how do you address that situation? <laughs> well, I would not pull into oncoming traffic. That would be my suggestion. Okay. You know, uh, we've all practiced. We've talked about it before. Our, our slow 
turning skills, mm -hmm. right? If we're parked at a light and, and we notice we know the flow of traffic, which direction it's going, and there's nothing wrong with just pulling out beside it. We're on a motorcycle and most of today's motorcycles are pretty small. Mm -hmm. We could get in beside a car, no problem. You know, it might not be uh, legal to yes. do that, but it's a lot better than getting rear Hit from ended. behind. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I might even suggest keeping the wheel just slightly turned to the right in preparation for a quick right turn if you've got to make it. But what if you're the second person at the light, a car is sitting there parked in front of you, now you're number two and you've come to a stop? Well, believe it or not, Dave, that's an even safer situation to be in. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure you're thinking of, well, yeah, right, I'm going to get sandwiched between these two cars now. Crunch. Right, but no, actually, again, you come up to the stop, be scanning your mirrors, have it in first gear with the clutch in, ready to go. And if you do notice the car that's approaching what you feel is too quickly or not paying attention or anything like that, I just suggest pulling up beside the car that's parked in front of you. Right, okay. Right Now that car in front of you, now he's the impact zone right. and hopefully you're off enough where you're going to miss the danger. Okay, so we've got that maneuverability, we're that slim, take advantage of it and get around and up to the side of that vehicle in front of us. When do we then decide it's okay to slick it and snip it down into neutral and let the clutch out and shake the wrists out and maybe pop the visor? I usually wait until there's at least two cars behind me. Two cars or maybe a big gravel truck. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Let those guys be the buffer zone, if you will. Right. You know. And one other thing too, if a guy does pull up behind you and stops and he's only a foot off you, move forward a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have to cross the stop line, that's okay. Make sure you leave that safety cushion back there. Okay, some great advice again on how to get through those intersections. Thanks, Clint. You know, Clint, on our last show, we were talking about intersections and where you should be and how you should handle an intersection when you're stopped. But uh, I want to talk about intersections because we know from the statistics, intersections are probably the most dangerous place on the road for motorcyclists. And I like to really drive the message home. Intersections, where should you be lane choice wise as you approach an intersection? Well, Dave, where you want to be or where I want to be would be in the safest possible spot. Mm -hmm. And that is dictated by what's happening in that intersection. Right. So again, back to the eyes and the scanning, mm -hmm. right? You have to be looking up, looking ahead, see what's happening. Okay, so before you can decide where you should be in your lane, you should be seeing ahead and figuring out what, what kind of a scenario you're approaching. So let's say I'm approaching an intersection and I can see there's a car turning left or preparing to turn left. It's got their signal on and I'm turning left in front of me. When I approach that intersection, I like to be, if I'm in the outside lane, if it's two lanes approaching that intersection, I like to be in the outside lane, but I like to be over to the right. Would you agree with that? Yes, if that's the I only situation. I want some wiggle room. I want wiggle room. If that guy decides to turn left in front of me, I want to be able to turn to the right, if I, you will, and I get out of the way. I think that's a pretty wise choice, Dave. You know, you're leaving yourself as much room, mm -hmm. right? You're, you're seeing everything you can see at the intersection. And the other thing, if there's a car parked in the left lane where you are turning left your direction, mm -hmm. you know, you want to be out there so that car that's turning left possibly in front of you can hopefully see you right you know another good thing to do is nothing wrong with giving a little high beam quick high beam right just hey i'm here coming through yeah he's got to yield to you or supposed to yield to you right okay so we've got that one down but then when there's no car ahead of you turning left in other words there isn't a car preparing to turn left in front of you you don't like to be over to the right you like to be over to the left in the lane that's right dave and the reason for that is so that I can see more of that intersection. I know, you know, straight ahead of me, there is no car turning, possibly turning left in front of me, mm -hmm. right? But I don't know about the intersection, the opposing traffic going the other direction. Is there a car coming up from the right-hand side? Right. And by me being in the left side of that lane, again, it gives me a little bit of breathing room in case last minute this car comes tearing up. You know, I still got a little bit of room. I can move over a little more and just accelerate through. It gives me an extra 10, 15 feet, whatever it may be. Okay, well, I, I don't want to confuse everyone at home because it's very hard to to demonstrate where you are in those lanes without, you know, a wet board or something like that. But I, but I, I guess what we can say with all certainty is that you're on a motorcycle and you need to, to move around a little bit in your lane and you need to choose the best place that's right for you. So definitely, though, when you come up to stop at an intersection, try not to park in the center of the lane. And definitely if it's raining, 
and it's just starting to rain, you try to avoid that center part of the lane as well because that can be very greasy. Very greasy, Dave. I'm glad you mentioned that. When it starts to rain out on the road, it's always really slippery and like you say, rain, we know oil and water do not mix at all and right. it's very slippery and that's where the oil is probably going to be is in the center lane there. And it doesn't take much, it doesn't really matter what speed you're going at. Right. You know, if there's a big big oil spill and the rain starts, it's going to it's bring that oil back up to the surface and it's going to take nothing to uh, go down there. Okay, so when it comes to intersections, keep your eyes moving, scan ahead, read the, read the zone, and, uh, and then, you know, you're on a motorcycle. Use the maneuverability and pick the lane or the area of the lane that's right for you. That's right. Terrific. Some great advice, Clint. Yeah, baby. So, Clint, this week you said, I get to pick one, I get to pick one. I want to talk about clutch control. And uh, of course, my reaction to that is facetiously, come on, you just pull it in, you let it out, right? It's, a, it's even got a spring. You just let her go, right? No. no. I'm sorry, Dave, <laughs> but no, you don't just let her go, which is, uh, that's the part I want to talk about the most is, is controlling it, releasing it on the release. You know, normally we use the clutch to upshift as well as downshift. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing that I notice on the street, I see people, is on the downshifting of gears. They'll come into a corner, they'll break, and they'll, and they'll go down a couple gears. And on the, it's the last downshift when they're setting their entrance speed for the corner that you see them a lot of times just let it out. As you said, that's all you do. It's spring, spring loaded away you go. Right. But no, that's not correct. That last downshift, when you go to release it, you got to have to be careful that you don't lock up the rear wheel because the engine might not be spinning as fast as the rear wheel. Mm -hmm. and there's a couple ways to control that, either with the throttle or with the clutch. Right. Right. You have two options. If you just let it out nice and slowly, just like we get on the gas nice and slowly, like we get on the brakes nice and controlled, everything is controlled, it'll allow that rear wheel, rear, that engine, to pick up to the same speed as the rear wheel is turning, and you'll eliminate that. Have you ever had that hopping feeling oh, yeah. when you're going into a corner, that sudden skid, and you're like, I'm not even on the brakes? Yeah. That's why you've released the clutch too quickly. Right and you want to eliminate that nice and controlled. So basically you have to practice engagement and I guess the other thing I'm hearing here is you have to feel for that friction point, right? You don't necessarily need to pull the clutch lever all the way in to activate it. No, that's right. It depends how you have it adjusted. Um, but most, most people, you know, it, it comes off the bar, I'm going to say an inch, half an inch. They can usually get their fingers in there mm -hmm. and then you feel for that friction point. It's like that friction point is, you know, when you go to start, leave the light or yeah. something like that. If you slowly let the clutch out and as soon as the bike starts to roll, starts to want to pull away from you or pull underneath you, that point right there, that's what you're trying to feel. That is called the friction point. Right. And from there, as you release it, that's when you're controlling, you know, the, the rear wheel speed with the engine speed. Right. So what I'm hearing here is A, practice and B, we're back to the old, it's not an on-off switch, right? It's a dimmer switch. You have to feel the engagement. It's a, it's a friction point. It's not just on-off. That's right. You must think I'm a broken record by now, but <laughs> they all have to be. It's control. It's all about control. And something you need to practice. Yep, very important. Some great advice on clutch control, not clutch switch. Clutch switch? No. No. You know, Clint, a couple of weeks ago we were talking about a motorcyclist's worst nightmare or biggest phobia and, uh, and I put forward that uh, it was probably taking a passenger and since then we've got lots of emails from viewers with other suggestions about phobias and the one that came up more uh, time and time again more often was the gravel surfaced, the grooved concrete, the, uh, the steel gridiron bridge and that whole sensation of riding on marbles. Yeah, that uh, the first time you experience that, I, I know I can remember the first time. I think mine was the groove pavement part, mm -hmm. and it is uh, it's now it's a neat feeling because I know how to do it properly. But the first time it can be a little overwhelming. Right. You know the bike tends to want to follow the pavement, and if those grooves aren't perfectly straight, you know the bike wants to meander. And, and the first reaction, unfortunately for people, is to hang on to those handlebars and make and make it a straight line. Right. To get through it, and that's really that is. Uh, that's the not, last thing you want yeah, to do. That's not what you want to do. Yeah. You want to stay uh, relaxed, as I say again, be relaxed, relaxed, grip on the handlebars, and let the bike follow the road. Let it do what it wants to do. Right. You know, to a, 
to a degree. Give up an element of control and let the front end go where it needs to go. Yep, let it track. And uh, you know, instead of hanging on so much with, with the handlebars, you know, maybe think about with your legs. Maybe squeezing the bike around the tank or something like that. Right. You know, if you're concerned a little bit with, you know, letting go of the, not letting go, but relaxing the grip a little more. Yeah. You know, you can always use your legs. Hang on and just, uh, you know, you don't want to roll off the throttle too abruptly. Just maintain a constant throttle. Mm -hmm. And the key is look ahead. And I guess the last piece of this puzzle is when you are going slowly on gravel, that's when you need to um, go after not the foot brake, but the foot, rear foot control, right? <laughs> All right, you remember that from the previous episodes. <laughs> yeah. We spoke of that, that, that brake pedal, you know, it can be used for one of the things with stability. Right. You know, especially at slow speeds. Yeah. If we can keep that motor spinning at a good rate, doesn't mean half throttle or anything, Yeah. but keep that going and just apply a little bit of rear brake maybe over top of that throttle when we have it at slow speed. Right. It'll keep the bike a little bit more stable. Right. So the motor's going to give you the gyro effect, meaning the bike will want to stay up, upright, but the rear brake, you can use it to slow you down and you have no fear of locking up the front wheel. That's right, because you're not going to use the front brake. Absolutely. Great advice for those marbly, slippery surfaces. I've just loved all the tips we've uh, been able to pass along this uh, summer season and um, I've been th we've been focusing a lot on novice riders and how to help them get through their first season, uh, how to improve veteran riders and I guess we've talked about gravel, we've talked about rutted roads, we've talked about taking passengers. One thing we didn't talk about was the dreaded stopped on a hill, how do I get started again? <laughs> yeah, it can be a bit uh, daunting. You know, mm -hmm. especially for someone new. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, the first time it happens, you usually have someone right behind you. You know, they, maybe they've given you a foot. Hopefully they've given you a foot. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of pressure on you too because you're new to yeah. do it. And there's a lot of things that you have to do quickly in order to get the motorcycle rolling so you don't go backwards. Well, you, you mentioned the car behind you, right? You can see the driver in your mirror. You start to panic. How am I going to get moving again? And it's almost like you forget that you have a rear brake control. Mm -hmm. And we've spoke about that a lot this summer. And it is, here's another great use for it. Yeah. Uh, as you're sitting there on that hill, you know, the light has turned green or whatever, it's your turn to go regardless of what situation. You get on that rear brake, apply it, put some pressure on it, and that'll allow you to release the front brake. So now all you have to worry about with the right hand is the throttle. Right. Right. So now you have one thing to do with the right hand, you know, and with your left hand is the clutch. And then you, you have to feel for that friction point. And once you've get that there, you feel the friction point, you apply a little more throttle, you feel it start to pull. And now I'm going to throw one more thing is don't forget to now you slowly release the pressure off that brake pedal. Right. And you're not going to roll backwards at all. You're just going to start to go forward, a little release the clutch some more as you're going. The next thing you know, all you're doing is rolling forward. Exactly. So again, we come back to the rear foot control, not the rear brake. We don't call it that anymore. It's not an on off switch. You have to ease that off as you begin to move. But you know, it's key because if you, if you're trying to do that with a, with your front brake and your throttle, it's just going to get nasty. It's the, the walking, chewing bubble gum, talking on the cell phone, all those things at once. You right. know, try to break it down, give, each, each hand a task and the foot, and away you go. So, just to recap, you get stuck on a hill, uphill, and it's time to leave your stopping point. Don't forget, you've got a rear brake. It's all under control. Yep, the rear brake's gonna help you go forward. Great advice, good stuff.